Uh, but we have we have a lot on our agenda, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so thanks for joining us for this workshop this afternoon on the Science Core Heuristics for Open Science Outcomes and Learning Project, specifically on our Water Resources Module Development. Uh, my name is Kit McManus. I'm a GIS developer at a research center called SEASON, or the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. It's up at the Lamont campus here at Columbia. Uh, you know, I've spent most of my career focused on creating data sets and applications for one of our biggest projects, which is the SAS NASA Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center, or NASA CDAP. Uh, so in, in that time, I focus primarily on mapping demographic information and also looking at the nexus between climate change and human interactions to add up how many people might be exposed to something like sea level rise. Uh, before we really dive in, I do want to mention that, you know, this is, this is a hybrid meeting, so we will have some participants joining via Zoom, and we want to just talk about what the code of conduct is for TOPS. Uh, this slide is taken from, from Shell Getman, who is the, the science lead from NASA on the Transform to Open Science mission, or TOPS. So, you know, the code of conduct, it, it really appeals to things that many of us know intuitively about having patience and humility, you know, empathy for others, listening carefully and actively. In other words, we're not, we're aiming to not interrupt people. You know, sometimes that kind of thing will come up, but we're, we're trying to build a community where people feel safe to speak their truths. And, you know, really that's what open science is all about is broadening the umbrella to in encourage folks who, you know, in traditional scientific settings, maybe weren't able to get a word in to be part of the process. Uh, so we'll follow the, the code of conduct today. Uh, I do also want to note that this meeting is being recorded. So, you know, part of the reason for that is, as, as you can see, the translation on the screen there and the captions from English to Spanish. So we're, we're making our, our project materials accessible in multiple languages. And, you know, one way we're able to do that is using conferencing technology with real-time captioning and translation services. Uh, so every, everyone knows we have a code of conduct. We're going to respect each other. And the meeting, it is actually being recorded. <laughs> now, I was joking earlier, oftentimes I mean to record something. And then it's like I'm five minutes into the presentation. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't hit record. And I'll hit record. And I'll very quickly go over the first five minutes again. So, so now I have this prompt in here for myself. It's like, if you forgot, hit record now. <laughs> uh, I did want to make everyone aware that FEMA is going to be running an emergency alert today at 2.20. Uh, so our phones will probably start beeping around that time. Just be aware that, it, you know, it's not, it's a test. It's not a real emergency. We don't need to have a fire drill or run out of the building. Uh, so, but, but before I dive in, I just want to quickly go around the room. Uh, we don't we don't have a lot of time, but if you could just say who you are and what your affiliation is. Again, I'm Kit McManus. I'm a GIS developer at Season. Jeff. Sure. Uh, Jeff Hammerling, University of Wyoming, and I'm associate director of our School of Computing, and I direct the Geographic Information Science Center. There. My name is Lauren. Yin. I'm a research scientist at the Columbia Water Center, and I specialize in data. Hi, I'm Pamela Green. I'm a research staff at the Santa Season. Hi, Lauren. I'm Christina Diodatis. I'm a research intern at Season. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Wong. I'm a postdoc from Fuji University and based through modeling, technology modeling about the land and water environment. Uh, hi, I'm Yuha. I'm a master student studying in Earth and Environmental Security Learning Program at Columbia University. Hello, everyone. I'm Lady Chen. I'm also a graduate student from uh, Columbia Water Center. Hi, um, I'm David. I'm a recently graduated master's student in economics um, from CUNY Country College and also a legislative director with the New York State Assembly. Hi, I'm Jim and I'm a PhD student from the University of Iowa and I'm a leader in geographic information science. And I'm interested in the education and curriculum design for 
Oh, very interesting. Uh, before we go on to the next, see you walk in. Oh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Volodymyr Mihanov. I am a visiting assistant professor at Charleston State University for Georgia campus. Um, so I teach geography and GIS, and my previous background is also in environmental science and uh, natural system interaction. Great, nice to meet you. Hi, my name is Olua Damirova, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Kentucky. Thank you, nice to meet you. My name is Mallory, I'm a PhD student at Auburn University. I'm going to teach my water faculty in water resources from Poly University. Uh, I, I'm Adam Fox. Uh, I'm a PhD student in statistics at uh, the UNC. I'm Kalina Borkevich. I'm at the University of Illinois National Center for Supercomputing Applications, or I'm the Director of Data Visualization. I see. I'm um, an Estonian mm -hmm. degree and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois. Hi, my name is Paul Martinez. I'm a senior research assistant at uh, CEDA. I'm Linda Pichelesi. I'm a for, for our online participants, uh, Tom, did you want to introduce yourself? My name is Tom Paris. I'm president of iSciences, uh, and you'll hear more about me later. Ryan? Hi, everybody. My name is Ryan Mead, and I am with the Educational Opportunity Program at Binghamton University. Josh? Uh, my, <clears throat> my name is Josh Brinks, and I'm a research scientist at iSciences, which Tom will tell you more about shortly. Uh, and, uh, Anand just walked in, so uh, just who you are and where you're from. Oh, I'm Padmanabhan. Uh, I'm a research associate professor at the uh, University of Illinois at Banasha. Great. Uh, so yeah, I think it's exciting. We have we have a great group of folks here, and I you know I appreciate everyone attending today. Uh, I just want to give you an overview. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Oh, Has Haseem, do you want to introduce yourself? We're just reaching the end of introductions, just who you are and where you're from. Hi, my name is Haseem Engin. I am from CISEN. I'm a GS specialist. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, so some of us may have heard of the TOPS mission before, but for those of us who haven't, uh, you know, the federal government in the U.S. has declared 2023 as the year of open science, and in accordance with that, NASA launched a five-year mission called called TOPS or the Transform to Open Science mission. The idea behind this is that open science can help us to accelerate major scientific discoveries. You know, if we if we reach out to the cloud, we can solve some of the wicked problems that we're facing in the world about, you know, climate change or any any other type of problem. Uh, you know, another objective is to broaden participation from historically excluded groups. So, you know, inclusivity is a, is a huge part of what NASA is advocating for and implementing across other missions. Uh, and the third objective then is to increase understanding and adoption of open science principles and techniques. And, you know, open science is something that, uh, you know, personally, I've been working on for about 20 years, and I recognize that I still have a lot to learn about it. So I think increasing understanding and adoption, it, it applies to people who are new in the field, but it also to seasoned professionals who may have been working on this for many years. There, there, there really is a lot that we can do to expand access and expand inclusivity in our scientific work. So how does TOPS conceive of what open science means? You know, many of us have heard of the FAIR principles that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And those FAIR principles, they're part of the equation here. Um, what I would, you know, what TOPS adds to that is this additional emphasis on, you know, in inclusivity and accessibility. So accessibility for TOPS doesn't just mean that you can find and download a data set. It also means that the data set is presented to you in a way that is sensible given, you know, your personal experiences and the, the background of your community. So it's like, how do we translate science in ways that it's accessible to everyone, not just that they can click and download it, but also it, it makes sense to them. 
Uh, you know, re reproducibility has been long sought after and uh, still a difficult thing to achieve. But, you know, as we move into these, these cloud-based workflows where we have the opportunity even to take an image of the exact computer we're doing data processing on and store that in the cloud, the idea of reproducibility is it's becoming more realistic than it has been, you know, no prior. So I think that part of what TOPS is doing is, is also making data available in cloud-based, you know, cloud-based interfaces, again, to, to bolster that reproducibility. So again, it's this idea that we need more people, you know, more hands, more eyes, more brains, and more diverse experiences in order that we can find the best solutions to problems. As experts, you know, we, we tend to be able to solve problems very quickly, but one of the downfalls of becoming an expert is we also tend to develop some tunnel vision. Like we have, there's certain problems we've seen again and again, and we'll find a solution that may have worked in the past. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best solution. So, you know, through broadening participation, in making a big umbrella where other people can participate, maybe we can disrupt methodologies and problems that in the past uh, had solutions that maybe weren't 100% desirable. Uh, so within the, you know, within the TOPS mission, one of the first uh, project outputs was a collaboration with the AGU to develop some online learning modules called OpenCore. Uh, so if, if you were to go to openscience101.org, you can gain access to these modules. And what it is, it's, it's five modules that present the basic ethos of open science. It presents some tools and resources we can use to bolster our ability to do open science. Open data, you know, many of the NASA data centers have been practicing this for a long time, but we're bringing it out and we're bringing it out and uh, with outreach through these learning modules to make it more usable for folks. You know, open software, which I think that when you hear the term open source and open science, most people think about open software. There's been a long history there of people doing open source versioned research with software, but maybe we don't know how which one to pick how to interact with it so the open software module it kind of lays out the gamut of what's available for us and then maybe most importantly is the open results like how do we take the research we're doing and put it in a vehicle where other people are going to be able to to access it uh, so you know our project the, the school project is a a second effort to do this same same type of thing, building out open science related modules. Uh, it's through a program called TOPS T, which was a NASA NASA Roses funded program, and it's it's called the Science Core because it's focused more on domain specific information about open science, whereas Open Core is very broad in general. Science Core is specific to different domains, and of course, we're all here to talk about the water resources domain today. Um, here's a list of the, you know, the 10 different projects that are working on this, uh, ours highlighted in red. Uh, you know, we'll share these slides out with participants later on, and you may want to look deeper into some of the other projects as well, which work not only on earth science topics, but also planetary science topics. So then what, what really is our school project? Uh, the objective of our our proposal is to develop curriculum for Science Corps that uses NASA data and use cases into the complete data science lifecycle. Uh, we'll do this through seven two and a half hour long learning modules, the water resources being the first of those seven modules. The other domains we'll look at are health and air quality, environmental justice, disasters, wildfires, agriculture, and climate. We will be working on this over the next two years. So definitely we'll keep everyone in this workshop in the know about when the next workshops are happening in different domains. And we'd really wel welcome you to participate in those as well if you're interested. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, my background is in population and infrastructure. So 
you know, above all of these these physical science domains, we're going to be interweaving human impacts information about things like, you know, building footprints or different demographic groups. So each of the modules will consist of five lessons. And, you know, the goal of these lessons is to go through a full data science life cycle and then to integrate open science practices throughout. So lesson one will focus on generation and collection of data. Lesson two, processing and storage. Lesson three is management and analysis. Lesson four will be visualization and interpretation. And then lesson five will be open science and community engagement. Uh, in the second session of our workshop this afternoon, we're gonna do a bunch of breakout groups and uh, brainstorming about case studies and lesson plans for each of these different sub lessons in the mortar resources module. Uh, the project takes an agile approach. So it's a two year project, but the modules will be developed during sprints, which really this is the kickoff for us, for our project iteration, where we're gonna do brainstorming about what our development sprints will be about. The idea is that we'll be releasing modules every six months, starting first with water resources. And then in the spring, we'll look at health and air quality and environmental justice. So one module, then two modules, two modules, two modules. Uh, for the water resources module and the proposal, we identified a couple of data sets. Uh, I'm calling out here. I won't go into to a lot of details about them, but you see one of them is the MODIS near real-time global flood, flood product. And the other one is this historic compendium on water security, WSIM GLDAS, uh, which ranges from 1948 to 2014. So some of the things we've been grappling with even in advance of this workshop is how, how do we how are we going to manage the different spatial scales and temporal scales? And there's just so much in the water resources topic. How are we going to narrow that down to things that are most useful for folks? Uh, the technical frameworks that we're going to be using, you know, the outputs are going to be Jupyter Books, uh, primarily Python based, although we're, we're open to including R as, a, you know, another language in those books. Uh, It'll be put in a GitHub's repository. There's still some discussions going on about the governance of exactly which repository or you know which GitHub it will live in. Uh, but we'll figure that out, and you know we'll also post things to uh, Zenodo, the the data centers, and even YouTube with these recorded videos. So at the end of the day, it'll be online interactive code. You know, I'd like to invite my colleague Juan Martinez up to just give us a little flavor of what what those things will look like. Thank you so much, Kit. Um, so as Kit mentioned, we are, our goal is to develop seven modules, training modules, science modules for NASA. Uh, each of these modules will be in the form of a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so I showed you here a quick schematic of what an open science and open software uh, system could look like. Uh, and this is kind of a system that we're heavily relying on, uh, as he, as Kit mentioned, is primarily Python and Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, with these Jupyter Notebooks, we will upload them online and make them public via GitHub. I don't know if anybody is familiar with GitHub, but it's it's kind of like an online repository that people can access and, and link to very easily. Uh, so in that repository, GitHub, uh, we have one here at Columbia, season, season has one as well, in which we'll be uploading the modules. Uh, but we're also working with a group called OpenScapes uh, that is also providing some template um, modules and, and, and web designs that we will be applying as sort of like keeping an ethos with the open science and uh, theme. Um, and ultimately those um, Jupyter Notebooks will be uh, kind of integrated with uh, software systems that are uh, such as Binder and Google Collab, which allow you to use uh, an online cloud system to be able to do processing or to be able to do uh, any kind of science um, uh, experiment or, or data processing right on the cloud. So you'll be able to access NASA data sets directly on the cloud and be able to process them online. All you really need is uh, an internet connection and a computer. 
Um, right now for Google Collab, the, the limitation is that you do need uh, an account, which for some people can be a limitation, but Google accounts are free for everybody. Uh, another tool is Binder, which is free, uh, but it's still kind of being developed to be used as a, at a larger scale. So I'll just quickly show you. Um, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Where did it go? So this is um, what a GitHub repository looks like. For those of you who are not familiar with it, we'll be uploading stuff to, to our own GitHub. Uh, but what I did want to show you is that the template that comes with GitHub allows you to create these what are called IO websites or IO uh, front-facing sites, which look much cleaner and are geared more towards uh, the user experience. So we plan to work with OpenScapes to uh, use some of their templates and apply it to, to our GitHub and provide information through there, as well as the modules. Now, what could a module look like? Um, as I mentioned, this is our season mm -hmm. GitHub. And in here, you can create different repositories. One of the examples that I wanna show you very quickly is the uh, hotspot training that we did. Uh, here you can see the Google Collab, but all the information, including the Jupyter Notebook, is linked here in our um, GitHub. So what the Google Collab link does is that it takes you to this kind of cloud system that gives you a certain amount of RAM and disk space. Up here, you can see in the top right corner, this is essentially a, a, a Jupyter Notebook with a Python script in it, um, which allows you to run all this uh, in the cloud. So this is just an example of what a lesson could look like, which would include, you know, you could include pictures, uh, video links, links to other websites. Uh, so in this example, uh, we've included a lot of information on, on vulnerability and poverty. Uh, but I won't be getting into that because the focus now is just to show you what, what it could look like. As you can see here, you, you can include UI links, uh, you can include images. Um, so this is kind of an introduction to what the what the topic is, and then it gets into more um, the data sets that we used, which are provided in the notebook. Uh, and then ultimately at the end, you start getting more into the coding, uh, which as a user, you can come in here and edit yourself and run the codes again, and it will give you, you know, a different result uh, each time or, you know, as you edit it. So the lesson can be dynamic because not only does it give you the information, but it also allows you to see how to develop a, a project or how to extract data from, from the cloud. Um, and it allows the user and whoever's teaching the lesson to also in real time play around with, with the values or display images, display rasters. Um, so hopefully with this technology, we can start integrating it with, you know, uh, water data, water resources data, or all the topics that Kit mentioned, so that ultimately these modules will look something like this, where people just go online, they access them right away, and they can start doing their own analysis. Uh, in this um, example, at the end, it's a vulnerability analysis in, in Colombia. Um, and at the end, it just kind of ranks a municipality by the level of multidimensional um, uh, stress uh, based on four different indi indices that you see here. So the, the script is combining all these data sets that are pulled from, from different sources and creating uh, a lesson on how to build uh, indices. But again, for this project in particular uh, and this forum, we're talking more about uh, water resources rather than um, vulnerability indices. Juan, you want to say why you, why you developed this hotspot training? Uh, sure, yeah. So this hotspot training, again, uh, I was in the spirit of open science. Um, you know, we have a lot of students that don't have access to ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online, and they don't they don't really know how to access these these uh, data sets. Um, and we we do collaborations as well with schools across South America. And so th this um, summer we went to uh, Amerigio which is kind of like a American geographer's uh, 
consortium and there's a lot of young students there that, that come to to learn a lot of these technologies. So we had students from Bogota, from Panama that you know drove hours to to come to to the uh, forum to the conference. Um, and so another reason why I wanted to show you is because you know at the beginning we provide this lesson both in English and in Spanish. Uh, you can see that the English is the black text, the Spanish is the green text, um, but you can split it into different notebooks. You know, it's just a, whatever preference you have. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we want to get feedback on. It's like how, how to manage multilingual lessons. Uh, you know, put, putting it all on one page leaves something to be desired, but it does it does unify everything in one one place. So uh, as we get into the breakouts, it's one of one of the things we'll discuss. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, our deliverables are going to be Ju Jupyter-based notebooks uh, that will either be downloadable or executable in online uh, tools such as Google Collab. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. no, I just see, see your hand. If you want to do this, what are the things? Uh, with instructions on what to change. Oh, if you wanted to execute it in another country? Yeah, instead of Colombia. Yeah. Um, All right. For yeah, so right now it's uh, just for Colombia because um, all of the uh, uh, data that I used is already in the GitHub. So I'm providing it in, as a folder that you're just kind of using the link to link to. But our next step is to integrate it with uh, NASA uh, cloud data, which will allow you to, you know, pick pick a site or do, do more of those kind of. Um, but in this specific um, lesson, it was more about how to do the. So yeah, ultimately you could do your own analysis with if you have your own files. Yeah, we should say that that effort was part of the this program called the Human Planet Initiative that was funded by the Group on Earth Observations. I see Barb here in the room. So definitely to mention GEO, having led GEO for many years. Because when you said America, America, oh, yeah. when I, I, I hope that's the GEO. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you, Barb. And just yeah. kind of get, get us moving in the right direction. Uh, yes. Could you say just a little bit more about the intended audience for the yeah thanks for the kind of just in general <laughs> yeah thanks thanks so much uh so there's open core and then there's science core so open yeah. core exists already it was a collaboration with AGU and NASA uh, their goal with that is to train twenty five thousand people over five years and they're, what they're looking at is undergraduate and above but inclu including professional teams. And for Science Corps, which our project sits within, it's it's the same target audience. We're looking at undergraduate and above, and also focusing on training out professional teams. I should say that within NASA, there's this idea that you know in the in the future, the badges that you can receive for completing these trainings are going to really mean something in terms of who gets hired and who doesn't. But uh, it's not not focused at high schoolers, although we, you know, we feel like maybe we would like to. Uh, so we'll see, you know, an advanced high schooler is, is almost an undergrad. <laughs> uh, so, you know, another part of this first portion of the workshop is we want to hear from some subject matter experts. I just want to want to thank each of them for joining us today. Uh, so I'll introduce the, our first SME. His name is Tom Paris. He's the president of iSciences LLC and his expertise is in impacts and vulnerability assessment. Uh, quick funny story is, you know, I saw Tom in the spring and he told me to get ready. He's like this, there are a lot, the, the sea temperature is really high this year and we're going to see things this summer that we've never seen before. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, lo and behold, smoke clouds rolled into New York City. Uh, so he, he He's a he's a bit of a prognosticator and he has some accuracy in that. But uh hope that's a it's a good thing. Good introduction, Tom. Feel free to say some more and I I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Uh let me get my slides up. 
All right, thank you. Will do. I think I do. I need to switch my screens here. I I can see it, Tom. It looks like the presentation mode. Okay, you have it full full mode now. And that that that's the present. Um, switch it to the other mode. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's always a, a bit of a mystery to me which. Uh... Okay. That's it. Good. So. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me today. I'm uh, looking forward to w working with you all as we move into the afternoon. Let me start by just giving you a little bit of a sense of who I am and, and who iSciences is. So my, my training is in math, computer science, and public policy, but all of my professional work has been uh, focused on an environmental science, climate science, um, uh, uh, risk assessment, vulnerability, uh, things like that. Um, and you can sort of see that reflected in what iSciences does as a company. We're a small work for hire consultancy and we do a lot of work on water and climate, which is what I'll be presenting today. Uh, human security, so food, water, energy, uh, public health and governance, uh, corporate sustainability, and we do so, some foundational and applied remote sensing. Uh, all of our work tends to involve geospatial analysis or, or, or time series analysis of one form or another. So uh, the, when people ask me what we do, I say we do geospatial analysis, um, but our, our niche within that is that we do that over large uh, um, territories, typically continental or global scale analysis. So what I'd like to do is start by just telling some stories. Um, and as I go through this slide, what I'd like you to do is think about your own lived experience in the past couple of years and uh, any sort of water related uh, 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 shocks or hazards that you've lived through uh, and um, how that might compare to what I'm about to talk about. So a little over a year ago, I was asked to do a presentation and I put this slide together these are based on news stories from the first two weeks of August 2022. Um, and water was, it was easy to find water stories from all over the world. So we had issues with uh, the, the Colorado River Basin and agricultural license to operate uh, and, uh, in the basin. Um, breweries in Mexico being asked to move from water stressed areas to less water stressed areas. Uh, Industrial supply chain in China grinding to a halt, in this case, primarily due to uh, 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 the lack of hydropower production, but that uh, uh, created uh, export issues for China. Uh, agricultural production issues in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, public water supply issues and drought, inland shipping issues in Germany. So when the Rhine dries up, they can't move the ships. Uh, real estate valuation in the US, um, due to climate risk. Um, this is actually about uh, wildfire risk in Oregon, uh, which has a climatic component and a water component. Uh, public health issues in uh, Italy due to extreme heat. Uh, Sweden, which is generally considered a very water-rich uh, nation, uh, had to curb their electricity exports because of a shortfall in hydropower production due to drought. And then uh, political instability in Iraq, uh, uh, protests over power cuts uh, that were uh, during a heat wave that also have a water component. So there's a lot going on in the sort of climate and water realm. And if you think about what happened this August, uh, you could easily populate a couple more slides of stories like this. Um, and I and, and you know I hope you've been thinking about sort of you know, the stories that you've lived through this year um, and uh, how that might relate to climate and water issues. So this is consistent with what the, the climate, you know, consensus climate science is saying. Uh, so the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the uh, every three to five year uh, global uh, uh, consensus assessment of of climate science and what it means for people. Um, and so I just highlighted some of their uh, observations about uh, uh, 
water issues. So uh, it's affecting weather and climate extremes, uh, every region of the globe. Frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events have increased, uh, likely due to human-induced uh, climate change. Human-induced climate change has contributed to increases in agricultural and ecological droughts. Uh, and, and there's a temperature component in there, increased land evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is the process through which plants uh, drink water to uh, convert, to, to support photosynthesis. And then as they, they use the energy in the water for the photosynthesis, they uh, effectively transpirate the water out uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, and um, human influence has increased the chance of compound extreme events, such as concurrent heat waves and droughts, which you talked about a little bit in the previous slide, fire weather, um, and compound flooding in some locations. So we have consensus science, we have lived experience, and what I like to try to do is tell stories that connect the two. So I'm gonna do that in the next two slides. So the first story is a, is a pretty old one, uh, but I, I really like this story because it sort of, it connects what's going on in climate with major uh, geopolitical events. So if you recall uh, in the winter of uh, the, the sort of winter of 2010, 2011, uh, in Egypt, there were massive protests in Tahrir Square um, that ended up overthrowing uh, the, the government at that time. Um, so what you're looking at on top here is a, the black line is the observed monthly average temperature uh, over time. And then the background colors are the return periods or how often you would expect to see a temperature of that uh, type on average of that level on average uh, using a 1950 to 2009 baseline period. So the, the blue shadings are, you know, where it's colder than average, the darker the blue, the rarer the event, so to the point where it gets to be a one in 40 year event. Uh, and then similarly, the, the warm colors are hot events, are hot uh, periods, uh, and, you know, where you would expect to see temperatures of a one in 20 or one in 40 year event at the, at the extremes. And so what we've done is plotted the observed temperature against the expect, expected temperatures. And what you can see is that during the uh, summer, late summer uh, and early fall of 2010, preceding the Tahrir Square uh, protests, it was the hot season. So that's the scientific units on, on top. And then if you just stretch it out in terms of return period on the, on the bottom, you can see that these are events that we, the circle events are uh, with, were, would exceed the threshold for what we would expect to see once every 50 years based on that baseline period. So it's really hot during the hot season, um, actually uh, during Ramadan as well. And then you can see a narrative on the left that talks about what that means. Um, and so what happened is, to deal with this, the, the Egyptian government was sort of exposed with some challenges. Do they release water from um, their major dam to produce electricity? Uh, or do they hold it back to produce ir for irrigation for agriculture? Um, that tension uh, resulted in uh, large scale uh, 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 rolling blackouts and brownouts in uh, Cairo. Uh, when it's really hot during a hot period of the year when you're trying to celebrate a major holiday. Um, and electricity is also needed for water distribution. So not only were the electricity cuts, but there are also water cuts. Um, and uh, it really began to undermine the, the legitimacy of the state. And there were actually protests in the street, uh, much smaller scale in Trier Square, but it, it demonstrated to the participants that they could you know, meet each other. And, and, and at least at that time, they were not partially repressed. And so it, it, um, it created uh, 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 an opportunity to sort of break down some of the barriers to collective action, which we then saw when it gets cooler in January, uh, the big protests in Trier Square. 
Story number two, um, the new energy economy and water issues. So one of our uh, solution spaces for dealing with uh, greenhouse gas emissions is to electrify everything um, and then use renewable generation for the electricity. But for transportation, that means we need batteries. And right now we're using a lot of lithium to produce those batteries. So there's a, a, a big push to expand lithium mining around the world. Lithium mining is, is incredibly water intensive. Um, and it tends to, lithium deposits tend to be in arid or, or semi-arid parts of the world that are experiencing more droughts. And so you see the story on the right, but what you're seeing on the left is the percentage of Chile's population exposed to uh, surface water anomalies. The reds are droughts, the, the blues are surpluses or above expected amounts of water. Um, and what you can see in the past decade is uh, really a long running drought in Chile. And that, that gray bar I'll talk about later is actually a forecast period. But now you have a situation where you're trying to build an industry that's water intensive in an area that doesn't have a lot of water and has ex been experiencing more or less persistent drought for the last decade. So that's a recipe for um, uh, challenges. So with those two stories in mind, let's zoom out a little bit and talk about uh, hydroelectric. I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to let you know, five, five minutes. Yep. Uh, the hydrological system. Um, and so we have, you know, precipitation that comes down. Uh, we have evapotranspiration, which goes up, which people call green water. And we have uh, uh, stream flow, which accumulates, which people call blue water. And all along that path, there are things like cities, industry, aquatic systems, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, agriculture that use the water. So one of the things that we look at is water stress. How much water do we want to use versus how much is available on a renewable basis? And the measure that we use is something called uh, is water stress, which is the, the, the ratio of the draws to renewable supply, less upstream consumptive use, that part that's primarily due to agriculture that uses the water in such a way that it's not available for subsequent downstream use. Uh, and so you can do that on multiple time scales. One is you can just sort of say, what's the current chronic condition? And then you can try to project that forward in time and look at how that chronic condition is gonna change uh, over the coming decades. Um, so the red areas are where people are effectively using all the uh, uh, renewable water uh, and, and that creates competition for the water. And it also makes the water more expensive because you start doing things like moving it from the Colorado to the Central Valley of, of California uh, uh, for irrigation. That's super expensive. Um, and then you can see large areas of the world are going to dry out. And these are actually <laughs> coincide with where a lot of our agriculture is. So if you look at consumptive use of water, uh, the big driver is irrigation. So that leads us to think about ways where we can map the consumptive use of water due to irrigation. And it changes considerably year over year because a lot of irrigation is supplemental, supplementing the, the, uh, the natural supply with, with the, the irrigation supply. So as the lower Mississippi gets wet, they need less irrigation in the lower Mississippi. As the upper Mississippi is dry, they need more irrigation in the upper Mississippi. And that's work that, that we've done. I can describe in more detail. So Kate mentioned that one of the data sets we produce is produced with this tool we call the water security indicator model. And this is a tool that monitors and forecasts surface wa water anomalies worldwide, uh, forecasts of lead times up to nine months. So what you're looking at here is a forecast where the dark red areas are deficit areas uh, where they're effectively drought areas. And the cool color areas and blues are where there's more water than expected um, associated with flooding, but there's quite a leap from just having a surplus to actually having a flood. Um, we actually have multiple versions of WSIM. Uh, so the version that Kit talked about, we use the, the modeling component from NASA, something called the Global Land Data Assimilation System. Uh, and then we do the statistics in, in WSIM. Unfortunately, that's a backward-looking data set uh, that stops in 2014. 
Um, and then we have two multiple versions of WSIM using different temperature and precipitation and other meteorological drivers. Uh, so some from the Climate Prediction Center at NOAA, which is a US uh, science organization, and the other from the uh, European Center for Medium Range Forecasting called ERA-5, which is a, what people call a reanalysis product. So what you can see here is 2010 broken into three month se sections. Um, big drought in Texas. Uh, in August was Irene in Vermont. Um, and you can see there's a lot of similarity between these different data sets. But you can also see that there's some pretty substantial differences if you take the time to look at them closely. And then you, when you compare that with the US Drought Monitor, uh, which is sort of the definitive US source for drought policy, you only drought, not surplus, um, you can sort of see additional differences as well. And so the, uh, the, the point here, the FEMA emergency is coming through, Tom. It's it's actually very, very right on point to what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the point here is there's a lot of uncertainty in the data. The choice of drivers actually vary more than the choice of models. Um, the drought monitor is a subjective assessment versus objective assessments from WSIM. And uh, the cho your choice of statistical baseline period also affects your, your, uh, your assessments. Um, so you can see the US drought monitor uses multiple baselines. We have a choice of baselines with WSIM that sort of vary with data sets. And then the other thing is that the drought monitor mixes short and long-term droughts uh, and everything you're seeing on WSIM is broken up by three months, which is sort of the, the short-term drought. So you have to understand that you're comparing a little bit of apples and, and oranges uh, across these different choices. So my last slide I want to leave you with is sort of how I think about these issues. So we have a place, which is that blue square in the middle, and that place is a coupled human environment system with uh, some attributes about how it can uh, uh, respond to various forms of stressors uh, and, and recover from those stressors or adapt to those stressors. Um, then on the left, we see that there's you know, variability and change in human systems. So uh, that's sort of the context that I was talking about in my first two stories about Cairo and uh, lithium mines in Chile. Um, and uh, that couples with variability and change in environmental systems. So the temperature in Cairo and the water, uh, and also the water in Chile. And these interact over different time scales to produce stresses uh, to which a place is more or less sensitive to based on what they're doing. So it's different if they're doing subsistence agriculture versus irrigated agriculture versus industry, um, and how those interact produce outcomes. And I've highlighted bad outcomes. It can also produce good outcomes. Um, uh, sustainability is the flip side of vulnerability. Um, what's not pictured here, which I think is, is really important where we need to take analysis in the future, is the interaction between places. So in 2010, part of what fed that uh, episode in Egypt is there was a massive drought in uh, Russia, and Russia, as a result, imposed an export embargo on grains because they were worried about feeding their own population which spiked food prices in Cairo. So the interactions between places are also really important. Uh, so I will leave it there. Hopefully I didn't go over too much. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, so, so I'll just ask folks, let's hold our comments until the end. A uh, Couple of more people to hear from. So Lorlin Jessat uh, is an associate research scientist at the Columbia Water Center. She works on the evaluation of water stresses. I don't want to read through the whole thing, Lorlin, but I'll let you introduce yourself. And I, th I think many people here even know you already, which is great. Uh, let me get your presentation up on screen, though. So my background, I'm a physicist by training. And then I did my PhD in groundwater modeling. I was focused very much on uncertainties. So that has been my obsession. I came here for a postdoc, and now I'm a research scientist here. And where I was, we were trying to develop a national uh, model for stress that was going to inform infrastructures and policies. 
you know, taking into account insurance and these sort of things from energy and um, agriculture, typically. And when I was doing this work, I grew quite frustrated with my background in physics and robust assessments on the lack of water data. And that has been my obsession for the past eight years is really focusing on water data. What is available? Why? And what are the gaps? And I think this is where... Sorry, the screen is not being shared. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. And so what I'm going to show you today is, uh, I think, a nice complement to what Tom uh, showed until now, that we're going to narrow a bit and look at something that we have here. And I'm going to talk about New York. Um, a lot of you are visitors. I hope you've been enjoying bagels and coffee. I don't know if you heard, but the excuse that New Yorkers make for them being the best is because of the tap water. I hope you've been drinking tap water but it's also quite difficult of knowing whether you can drink it or not. That's not what everyone knows about. So what I'm going to show you is really a bit about the tap water in New York City through data platforms that are um, available. So the first thing you can do is actually go to the New York City Environmental Protection website and you can see the current water distributions. And what you see, this is a map of New York where we have Manhattan and everything is in blue because everything comes from the cat scale Delaware. I think that might be the first surprising element. We're by the Hudson. We're not by the Delaware River. But all of the water that we're consuming today comes from the Delaware River. The reason for that is that if you want to see, um, I don't know if that's readable on the screen, but this is the line for the 100 miles that you have here, so 160 kilometers. All of our waters today come from the Delaware River that is flowing here from these reservoirs that you have here. This is the data that you can get from today from the New York City Environmental Protection. And you can see the status on the terms of the capacity of the reservoirs that we have currently. And you can see what is the, the releases. I got these screenshots this morning and you have the data from yesterday. That's something that I'm going to bring up a couple of times. <laughs> Um, so that's one thing. You can see that the water came from here, it traveled by um, aqueduct, and then it went further down, and then there's a bunch of pipelines, uh, aqueducts, that feed into the city. And what you see here is New York City, and what's interesting is that you have local valves that you, allows you to shut off the system, but if you have a leak above, a tiny bit above that, you need to shut off the whole system, which is above here, and you got a... a you know, and the distribution of water in the city. So I mentioned Delaware, and that brings us to another platform, which is the Delaware River Basin Commission. This is a water compact. So that means that the states have been fighting and the federal government step in to create a, a coalition of states that are going to negotiate how much can be released. And what you see is that at the very top or the slide that you have here, these are the status of the New York City reservoirs and you have the federal reservoir storage. The thing that is quite interesting to me is that the, the, the releases that New York City is allowed to make from the reservoir to go into our tap water is linked to this, the salt front location. This is all the way down here. Um, what you see is the Delaware River goes down here, that blue line here. And you have the Delta here in Pennsylvania. And what we're trying to manage is where is the salt from location? If I'm not wrong, this is here. And we're trying to do that because that's going to jeopardize the uh, water that is available to the city of Philadelphia. So I don't think that's quite straightforward. And when we think about GIS, when we want to think about infrastructure and people, this is where we really need CSN to step up. There's a lot of things to take into consideration there. But then, you know, so you have this water, everyone tells you, um, well, just to, to go back to that here, uh, what's happening, there's actually very little treatment because these reservoirs and the water basin that is around them is very well managed, very like highly security around them. And they test the water, but there's no need to treat it. Basically, you just let it sit. The sediments will deposit to the bottom. There's a UV treatment to make sure that there's no bacteria. And then it's sent to the city. Then there's things happening in the city, and this is where it gets a bit difficult. I'm not showing you many platforms there because there's none. You cannot know. There's um, the, the city does a great job, but it's not publicly disclosed on where it's happening. 
uh, what's happening is that you have chlorine, you have fluoride that is added to the water. Both of them are to protect our teeth for the fluoride. The chlorine is to make sure that there's no bacteria that develop when you store that water, right? This is the city storage, but then you have the water tanks, which is also a stipend of a highlight of New York City. Please look at them. They're on the top of all the buildings. You see this um, wooden barrel with the tiny roof. That's the water tanks. But one thing that you might be aware of uh, is microplastics, PFAS as being a threat, what we call forever chemicals. These both are not regulated, so you don't see that out of them. What is regulated is lead. And what I'm showing you here is that platform that does exist that is quite rarely known by people, but you can look up each building and see whether there is lead in the pipes. So that tells you a lot about your exposure that is happening. What I'm showing you here is that if you're at Columbia and you're renewing, you're renewing your visa and you go to Student Baker, it's a building that is right over there, there's, not lead, there's no lead there, it's quite certain. And depending, you can look up your address and see, you can look up your hotel and see if there's lead pipes there. That gives you a good, uh, a good overview. Here, when you're drinking from the tap, the fountains, they're well maintained and they filter lead. One thing that we might be interested in is really uh, looking at the exposure of students. We know that kids are very much susceptible to lead. Uh, we all are. There's no level of lead that is safe. But when you're a kid, and I think the very sad uh, things that happen in Flint, Michigan, but that happened in New York, that happened in many occasions. There's actually a screening for all babies be before one year old in New York City because of the lead paint that you might have. Is really mentoring and making sure that kids do not expose to lead. So you can go to that page that is within the New York City Department and tells you um, the Department of Education and the link is there. So that's at the city level. Thankfully, you can move to the state level and there you have a data set. Um, sorry for the screenshot. The screenshot, like it's really updated every week. The data doesn't change, but it's updated. Uh, it was created in 2020 because that corresponds to a regulation that was put in place to monitor, and this is a state level uh, initiative. You see many states have it, many states don't have it at all, and states, there are states that monitor it, uh, but don't necessarily regulate it. So you have obligations in New York State on what you're supposed to do about lead. And if you look at the data, and you go quite naively, one thing that you want to see is really the level um, they're measuring every outlet that is that the, the risk of having lead above 15 ppb. One thing to know is that actually that regulation has changed. It's not 5 ppb, but you have no data on that. But on 15 ppb, what you see is that for 2,470, so for um, you do not have any issues, but for 1864, so 40% of schools, you have outlets with lead above 15 ppb. And what you see is the percentage of schools that have outlets above 15 ppd. Outlets is basically a tap or a fountain or something. So that's very scary, right? The first thing is like you, that's not okay. Um, we know it's unsafe and that leads to very bad outcomes. But if you look at other columns in your data set, what you see is that out of these 18 and 64 schools, there is 18 and 51 that have taken appropriate measures, but you do not see that when you see the land, the the, quant the number of outlets that have been affected. And for 500 uh, more of them, uh, more than 500 of them, they have completed the remediations and it is lead free. In 12 schools, which is not, you know, there's 13 of different, so there's a school that hasn't taken the appropriate measures, but has remediated the issue. You know, so that's where when you get into the granularity of your results, it gets a bit messy. You have still 12 schools that have outlets above 50, 15 ppb. And the question that we have there is really, uh, why has resampling not happened and the data set has not been updated? Because do you trust one column over the other? And they're supposed to, accord this, uh, according to the Department of Health regulations, they should have updated these results. And what is happening for these 12 schools? And it's one thing to know that things have been fixed, but what happened in the past? Right? What if you were a student there? Um, these lead pipes are not from yesterday, they're from a while, and you could be 20 years later and have been exposed to that lead. 
are you scared or not? What should happen? This is not an easy solution. I'm not blaming the state for mismanaging it. It's very difficult. The problem is that lead is not everything. And there's other contaminants that you might care about, right? This is one view, but you need to think about the other issues. So this is where um, you always want to focus on the people that you're service servicing. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the purpose of your study? What you care about is the student. What you care about is not the lead, the students and the quality of the water that they're drinking. And that should shape what data sets you're going to use on. So let me just give you uh, an overview of what we're trying to do is really teaching and advocating for potability. TAP, quite proud of the acronym. Um, this is, uh, we got funding from the climate school to do a one year uh, kickoff for this. And this is actually coming from um, some research that we did uh, uh, a while ago that was about preparing middle and high school students to tackle water justice issues. And what we were doing this is that we work with teachers at the Eagle Academy, which is a high school that is really close by. Um, and we learn through the teachers on what learning standards they are using. They are the national level, the state level, or the city level. And we establish a list of keywords that we collectively thought were relevant for water, data, and social justice. We went for food, we went for many domains. And so the highlights I'm showing it here is that water drinking infrastructure is barely discussed. Top water is never mentioned from any of them. Climate change is mentioned quite a lot of time, but sea level, sea level rise only three times. Um, irrigation is only seen at the AP level, which is like if you take a specific course that is going to prepare you for college, this is when you're going to talk about irrigation according to the learning standards, right? And environmental justice is not mentioned yet because although we have the Department of Justice that focuses on environmental justice, these learning standards are from before that creation. So our project here is to develop learning standards, curriculum, and teaching material to work with the students directly, the instructors, the principals, and researchers. And so what we're going to work is really do a mix of this governmental data and self-collected data, because actually there's very simple tests that you can run to gain the confidence. And what we're hoping is that together will lead to student water empowerment. Uh, student empowerment maybe is a concept that uh, the people that have spe uh, specific um, specialized in water in student education, you would know well, but um, we want to decline that and think, what does it mean in the water context? So if you look at open data in New York, um, is the data fair, right? So that's what um, Kit was mentioning, findable, interoperable, accessible, reusable. No, from a water, uh, from a governmental data perspective. There are great things that existed, but overall it's no. You have two initiatives that exist, the open data for all New, all New Yorkers from New York City level and the New York State initiative, open data that has been created for 10 years now. So these are really helpful, um, but they're not everything, but it's a step in the right direction. So to conclude, brace yourself if you're going to work with water data, there's a lot of things to consider. And what really I wanna keep it would be wonderful if you can keep focusing on the purpose, really, what is the question that you care about? Too often there's, oh, there's a data set that is available, let's push it forward. And what questions we can serve? No, let's review the gaps in our data. What does it mean in terms of domain, resolution, the accuracy, the timeliness? You want data that is concurrent. You wanna know if you can drink the water now. You wanna know if you're going to have a flood now, not uh, what happened two years ago. If you look at water use, the data is old. It's from 2020. Otherwise, we don't have, we don't know how much water has been consumed uh, quite uniformly across the, the, the federal level. And data is not everything, right? When we talk about open science, open data is one aspect. There's all of the other elements that are covered, um, but there's also narrative data, there's oral C, that is a key part of this. Um, there's many cultures that do not rely on these numbers. There's many of us that do not rely on these numbers. Uh, we need to make sure that we work throughout, and this is where I really look forward to working on TOPS and working with the team uh, to see what we can do in terms of visualization, interpretation, and getting in these stories that do matter and reflect and interpret the data much better than the data. And that was it. Um, just the work is done by you, Han, sitting at the back. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Laurelyn. Uh, again, uh, we'll we'll have time for questions at the end.
Uh, so as you can see, we're, we're up against the tall task. There's a lot of sub issues here. And how are we, we going to boil this down to two and a half hours of lessons? Uh, and I think, you know, like Lauralyn concluded that, that the quantitative side and the qualitative side, they're both, both important for us if we want to really communicate this stuff. Uh, so then finally in this first session, I'd like to introduce our subject matter expert, Ryan Mead from SUNY Binghamton. Uh, his background is in sociology and he's been working as the coordinator of academic support services at Binghamton University in the educational opportunity program. So he's gonna help us to kind of bring it all together and say, how, how can we educate folks about this while being inclusive, while taking into account diverse backgrounds? So Ryan, uh, I'll go ahead and stop share. All right, hello everybody. Um, as Kit noted, my name is Ryan Mead and I am going to share my screen so we can get started. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Awesome. All right. So, um, Kit talked a little bit about who I am. I'm just going to um, emphasize just a little more. Um, yeah, I have 14 years working in higher education, experience working in higher education. As Kit noted, I do have a um, PhD in sociology and 13 years teaching experience. I teach across um, a wide variety of disciplines. I mainly focus on um, sociology. In addition to working at Binghamton, I'm an associate professor of sociology at SUNY Sullivan. I also focus on first year composition, academic leadership courses, and um, success skill courses. But my main job is working with the Educational Opportunity Program. Um, this has um, many different variants across New York State. Um, there's the Educational Opportunity Program for SUNY. There's um, higher education opportunity program for private institutions. Um, Columbia has one. Um, there's a SEEK program in um, CUNY schools and so on. Um, and we are a longstanding um, program. Actually, this year we are celebrating our 55th anniversary. And we were born out of the civil rights movement and we really focus on um, different elements of social justice. Just as a really quick recap, what we do is we help um, students from um, underserved communities and historically marginalized backgrounds and help them transition into college and succeed. So the elig eligibility for EOP is a student must be a New York State resident for at least 12 months, qualify as economically disadvantaged according to New York State guidelines, um, also to require special admissions consideration. So our students are initially denied admissions into the school, in this case, Binghamton, and then they are accepted into the school only through EOP. Um, so what do I do in EOP? Um, I assist students in their transition to college um, by really focusing on student success initiatives. I work a lot with different faculty members all across campus um, in developing curriculum for things like our summer bridge program as well as our um, tutoring program. I recruit and train student success professionals and instructional staff, um, and, as, and I collect, assess, and report data on student success initiatives. In addition to all this, I run the tutorial center um, and yeah, work with a whole host of different um, student employees and professional employees. So, um, now that that's out of the way, the one thing I want to focus on is the driving question. The thing that has me really interested about this program um, is, you know, how do we um, expand access to different students um, through um, this open science initiative? So the question here I have is how can we enhance the NASA top school water resource modules to support development, success, and agency of students from underrepresented populations? And there's a whole host of ways um, I've been thinking about this. And one of the things that I've really been thinking about, um, not only myself and then talking to Kit, as well as others on this call, is, you know, three different elements. The first is, you know, how do financial concerns impact um, 
not only um, students in this um, program, but also to how how we think about developing these modules. This relates to things like wealth and income of individual students, as well as access to resources such as housing and food, or whether or not other responsibilities such as work is conflicting with these students' ability to engage in the curriculum and network with others. So, you know, financial concerns um, expand a whole lot more than just, you know, having um, money. Um, it's what money, what these resources can help these students do and the um, freedom um, and the agency provided to those students because of those financial resources. Another element is cultural capital. Cultural capital is a concept developed in the late um, 1970s and 1980s by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. And it's really defined as the um, non-financial assets such as knowledge, skills, education, manners, tastes, fashion, etc. And th these are things that people inherit, uh, inherit or acquire by association um, with their group. Um, so Bourdieu argues that society is organized around certain cultural and social expectations in which those from high status positions use their cultural capital to maintain or increase their social status. Um, and, th and this is really, really important. So, you know, um, scientists have their own senses of cultural capital. And these things are really unspoken and they come through again, not only in terms of knowledge and skills and education, but manners, tastes, fashions, et cetera. Um, so these are things that we wanna be um, not cognizant about as students who aren't from these backgrounds, who may be, let's say a first generation college student um, coming into these, um, coming into these spaces um, may experience. And then the last one I want to focus on is the hidden curriculum. And the hidden curriculum, it's a, it's a critical sociological concept um, that really came into prominence in the late 1970s and 1980s by people like um, Gene Anyan, Philip W. Jackson, and Michael Apple. And this is defined as the unwritten, unofficial, and unintended lessons values and perspectives that students indirectly learn while in school that's different from the official curriculum. So whereas the official curriculum in this sense is water resource management, you know, and water resources, what 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 are students learning unofficially by going through these modules, the way they're taught, the way that they, you know, um, are told to interact with um, their peers, the way they're told to interact with the people teaching it, um, things like that. So the hidden curriculum largely is shaped by um, a school's environment and structure, as well as the culture, experience, and expectations of the staff and faculty within it. Um, so again, this kind of pushes back, or this kind of goes back to the cultural capital of those staff and faculty members. So, you know, what I want to do is I kind of just want to focus on, you know, um, different sub-questions revolving around this, as well as potential solutions, potential ways to move forward and think about how to design um, these modules um, for these students. So some of the sub questions I, I was thinking about is in what ways is the NASA TOPS initiative addressing these issues? Um, in what ways is the NASA TOPS um, initiative not addressing these issues? So such as things like financial concerns, cultural capital, hidden curriculum, and how can we develop curriculum in ways that ensure that we are carrying out the NASA TOPS missions and goals that um, Kit went over at the beginning uh, of this session. So the first thing I want to do is I want to address um, the top two, the first two questions. So addressing and not addressing these issues. And the reason I'm lumping these together is because this is largely focused on you, the designers, the educators, um, the staff members um, coming around, you know, and I'm um, developing this and carrying this out for students. So in what ways can we really, you know, um, or what ways can we reflect on how and how not 
this NASA TOPS missions is addressing these issues. You know, the first and foremost thing is just reflection and discussions of these issues um, by the educators. Um, another thing too is, you know, different brainstorming activities, you know, trying to get outside of ourself. Um, so playing role reversals and adapting the role of your students, you know, so thinking about the different, you know, um, the different um, environments, the different, you know, cultural contexts in which our students are coming from, as well as the different um, bases, um, you know, knowledge bases in which our students are coming from. This is something, you know, there's a um, fallacy out there, a logical fallacy called the, the curse of knowledge, where, you know, when we become so highly educated in one thing that we think that, you know, things in that field are common knowledge, and they really aren't, you know, and this brings me back to, you know, there's many students I'm, I work with who are very interested in getting into, you know, um, get, getting into things like coding and computer science. And they take a class called computer coding or beginner computer coding, thinking that this is, you know, for them. And they realize that it's so advanced that they're unable to do that. So they're pushed out. Um, and I've seen numerous students who you know, really, you know, are engaged in wanting to learn, you know, science, wanting to learn coding and realize that what they are, you know, pr what's promoted as beginner level really isn't that, you know, the, the level is much higher and they get, you know, denied access to these spaces. So really trying to get inside the heads of the students that you're working with and where they're coming from. Um, Ryan, I'm sorry to interrupt, but five, five minutes, okay? Oh, wow. All right. So things like conducting a diversity audit of already planned materials. So going through already planned materials and trying to figure out, you know, um, where you're at in, that, in terms of that, in terms of diversity. Um, providing workshops, as well as gathering feedback from diverse stakeholders. So all these things you can do before you even start, um, before you even start, and trying to figure out, you know, are my workshop, are these modules going to be speaking to these student populations? Now, let's look at developing um, the third question. And this is largely geared towards students, you know, so how can we figure out how best to help the students in the program? The first thing that I always, you know, talk about, you know, whenever I'm doing anything is develop pre-program surveys that gather information about students. I do this with the summer program all the time. I send out these surveys to students to see where they're coming from and how I could best help them where they're at. Ensuring materials that adhere to universal design principles and offer multilingual support is another key thing. Um, customizing content for diverse backgrounds, including using real world examples and inclusive language um, is another one. Um, creating a centralized um, resource repository where students can easily access materials and more importantly, access materials even when it's outside of the module so they can come back to it and access materials from it. Um, clearly defining um, learning objectives in order to communicate the intention behind learning materials. Again, really, really important is, you know, defining why you're doing what you're doing. You know, that there is a plan, there is, you know, a method to everything and how it's going together. Um, and then from those learning objectives, working backwards and developing that lesson plan. So this is a, you know, a really big instructional design principle, create the learning outcome, then work backwards. What type of lessons do I need to use? What type of assessments do I need to use, et cetera? Overtly discuss the impact of things like wealth inequality, cultural capital, and the hidden curriculum on higher education within these lessons. Um, incorporate representative examples of people who are successful in the field. Um, publicizing outside resources and supports that students can utilize. Offering mentorship and networking opportunities outside of modules. I think this one is really, really important. As Kit noted, these modules are lasting 2.5 hours. You know, what can students, how can students expand on this outside of that 2.5 hours? Um, and instituting feedback, evaluation, and assessment mechanisms, as well as action plans for both staff and students. I'm a big believer in feedback and trying to figure out not only the strengths of what I'm doing, but the weaknesses and getting as much, you know, 
feedback and data from those students and then figuring out how to create, you know, changes and action plans from that, I think is really, really important. So I just want to thank you all for your time. And if you have any questions, there's my um, contact information, but I will stop sharing and um, hand it back over to Kit. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Uh, so, you know, we, we're running a little bit short on time. You know, I, ha I had panel questions that I that we had prepared for our panelists, but I think I'd like to open it up to audience questions just in case anyone has something burning in their mind that they'd like to ask. Or, or not, I, you know, <laughs> we're post lunch in here. But uh, so if there are no questions from, or go ahead, Laura. Yes, you can ask a question to yourself. My guys thought and and the audience that I expected here, and I think this is where I failed, you know, in terms of the things that I should have mentioned. One thing that is tricky when you talk to water about with most water researchers that people have a very specific lived experience. And sometimes I come to Switzerland, I have more or less a young class, very privileged. For a lot of people, water is actually a traumatic experience. And if I talk casually about lead, this is not uh, an easy subject. And when I mentioned that number, I know that this is scary if you are a parent and you have kids in New York State. What do you do about this information that I just gave you? And this is where I think there, there's Something that is quite difficult between the, the real experience and the solving of the issues and solving that scale about having global problems um, that may seem sometimes a bit abstract and the violence of the daily reality of dealing with water, right? We have massive flood on Friday. Um, yes. Can we do something about this? What does it mean to work on this now? This is, I think, a challenge. And this is where you are extremely valuable to us, water subject matter experts. And to get us out of that bubble that um, Ryan mentioned. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, yes. I've got a question that kind of follows on a bit from that. Um, do you think the public perception of um, how like lead contamination in water is treated within the media is perhaps different to uh, other kinds of like industrial contaminants, like due to the health effects of um, lead, like say versus asbestos? Which causes me so you know, that's kind of a bit more like maybe I mean say like graphic in, in some ways. So do you think um that at all affects how people perceive um, right, it just, definitely. just just to restate the question for folks online, the, the, the question is do you think that the treatment of lead specifically in the media has an impact on you know public perception compared to other things such as asbestos? Uh, I think this is key, um, because we have high schoolers that come to us and they say, I want to talk about microplastics because I'm a high schooler and I've been told that in the press and nobody's giving me answers. Actually, I work with a high schooler and we tried looking for all the microplastics related data that we had around New York City and we had to go to New Jersey to find the data set and that was a bit in muscles. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, well, this is actually, what is going on? You know, if you place yourself as a high school student, I hear that every single day from even the onion, people.com talks about this. And nobody's providing answer to that student on where we're getting that. And I think there's there's really a tremendous gap there. Uh, so just to, to, to pose another question to to Tom. Uh, you know, Tom, what do you see as the most critical gaps in water resources data? Um There are many, um, but the, the data, I would say I'll focus on two. So we've already focused on one, which is water quality at various scales. Um, and then the other is um, the water use. How much is being used? What is it being used for? Uh, how is it being discharged? How much of it is being discharged? Uh, what is the deterioration in quality uh, uh, associated with that use? Um, you know, uh, and 
you know, this builds on some prior conversations we've had, but I, I'd say those are really the two areas that are least well understood. Sure, thank you. Uh, so Ryan, I, I wonder, you know, what types of additional resources would you recommend to enhance an online learning experience? Are they things like external readings or websites, or is there any other types of things that would be useful to create a, a, a good online inclusive learning environment? Um, I would just suggest, you know, really, um, instead of just delving into the literature, just because there is a lot of it and there's a little amount of time utilizing the resources that are on your campus, such as, you know, your institutions, um, teaching and learning center, uh, as well as things like that. I could also provide a short reading list um, for those types of things as well. But I think really, you know, working with the institution, one of the suggestions I had was a centralized learning repository. So, you know, using like an LMS, like our institution uses um, Brightspace D2L. I usually, for every single initiative I do, I make a Brightspace page where I post everything there. Or if you want to have a private website where you post links and things like that, too. That And just ensuring, too, you know, working with, you know, your Center for Learning and Teaching to ensuring things abide by universal design principles um, and things like that. And also um, diversity experts and creating, you know, um, documents that have inclusive language and things like that. that those are some of the things I would suggest. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, or online? So keeping things on time is a challenge for me, as maybe you see, but uh, I know everyone will need a, will need a break before we get into brainstorming. I did just want to say that this afternoon we'll be joined by some more subject matter experts, Nancy Degnan, who was the assistant dean at the School of International and Public Affairs here and is the current director of the Center for Environmental Research and Conservation. She has a, you know, a great background in teaching and learning who will help us to kind of refine our messages. Um, Deborah Balk is our research professor and director of the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research. Uh, she's gonna to talk to us this afternoon about human impacts and water resources data. Uh, so I hope, hopefully that's enough to bring you back after the break. Uh, thank you again for our subject matter experts. We really appreciate your time. It's really useful for us as a project to see these, these broad and diverse perspectives. Uh, this afternoon, we'll return here at 3.30, and the focus then is going to be on breakout groups for use case development. So thanks for attending this first session. Enjoy the break, and I hope to see you back here at 3.30. Bye, everybody. Bye, Ryan.
All right, folks online, we're just going to give it another minute or two for fo folks here at the conference to come back in after the break. I know, yeah. <laughs> and is that, is that rain water? No. no. It's going to be just on the height difference between the red and the one. Uh, you cannot um, put the pressure up to five stories. They can go higher and mm -hmm. pump it up so that it's pressure. Uh, Oh, that's why they're on low building. Sorry? That's why they're on low building. No, that's why they go. You know that they have more than five stories. So below five is known. Oh, below five. Is yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and when it's more, it's just because the, the pressure for the, the reservoir is going to be at a higher altitude. So they're not going to the water up. Uh, the, uh, and then other, and so in the really cool building, you can still see that there are higher levels on the volcanic from that behind it. And in the part of the building, you can see in line with the other extent. Okay. Uh, so th th thanks everyone who are sticking with us. Uh, you know, our, our audience in the room is shrunk a little bit, but that's okay. That'll give us more of an opportunity to influence the direction of this project. Uh, so there is a link on the whiteboard here in the room and I pasted it into the chat for other folks if they wanna go to the, the agenda, which has questions that we'll be thinking about uh, as in breakout groups. But to get started, I wanted to go around the room with an icebreaker. We heard we heard both Ryan and Laurelyn call for qualitative information on water data. Sure. Uh, so so I, I wanted to point out that at the bottom of this agenda, which again I pasted it into the chat, and there's also a bit.ly link. Uh, there's a there's a Google form that if you wanted to continue to engage with us on the development of the water resources module over the next three months, uh, you can fill out that form. And what we'll do is we'll have a couple of check in meetings so that you can comment on our development progress and then get a first look at the final project at the end. Uh, but, with, you know, with a more intimate group here wanted to go around the room and you know we've all introduced ourselves we can introduce ourselves again and then a couple of questions you know the first is what why did you decide to participate in this workshop and then perhaps the most important question is what is your experience or relationship with water like think thinking back on you know your life how has water impacted your life? And I, you know, I'll, I'll start out with this you know, again, just for people who might just be joining. Uh, you know, I'm Kit McManus. I'm a GIS developer at a research institute called Season here at Columbia. Uh, when I think about, you know, what my experience is with water, I was just saying it in Lor in Laureline's presentation earlier. She had a slide that pointed to the Catskill watershed that you know that serves New York City drinking water. And it, you know, it happens that I grew up in this area and 
there's a family history there where these reservoirs, when when they were you know being created, there were many eminent domain decisions that went into it. So there there are there are entire towns that were underneath where some of the reservoirs are now located. And my my maternal grandmother's family happened to live in one of those towns. So you know I learned from a very young age one about eminent domain and how it can kind of drive your family off in another direction, and then two about how important these reservoirs are and you know this this amazing story that New York City has a largely unfiltered water source in the Catskills, which I think uh, is pretty unique in the world. So, you know, my whole life has been kind of, uh, my relationship to water has been defined around, you know, this idea that we're, we're, we're capturing things in reservoirs and we're serving people in urban areas. Uh, that I'll pass it on to Adam. Uh, yeah. Um, so, oh, should I do the first question? Uh, one thing. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Um, I think I was so, um, one one of my primary interests is sort of to make the data products are available for water. Um, because I'm a statistician, so doing my PhD in statistics, so um, that's kind of the most directly relevant to my research. Um, and then. Uh, regarding my experience with the relationship with water, I guess kind of like I don't know, from, from call it from back, but um, I grew up in Hong Kong and I went to school. I attended there. Um, they did also find like really high levels of um, legend of drinking water there as well, like from the drinking fountain. Um, yeah, and I guess at my grandparents' place in the UK, the tap water there is quite high quality, it's really good. And um, they, you can look online the data regarding. Um, I I'm not sure if they have the lead levels contained in that data, but they have um, the mineral levels. So I thought that was kind of interesting to like see how hard the water is in different parts of the UK. And all that information. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Jessica. I'm from Ireland. Um, um, I I do a lot with floods, so um, I kind of just wanted to attend this workshop to gain some insight on you know our drinking water and stuff like that. Um, I am going to be starting a project to do um, water filtration, and so it's good to know about you know contaminants in the water. Thank you. Oh hi everyone. My name is um Kate. I call me Stella. Yeah, and I'll be from the same school and the same lab researching. And um, why am I excited? So we had a workshop this morning to share our tool. Uh, we developed um, several several tools. Uh, so we um, can hear and share what we did. And also, um, I want to see other people how they did it and what the passion about uh, how to use them together those information. Yeah, and my research is mainly focused on flood risk, um, uh, studying the impact of um, wetland and sediment storage on um, large uh, water sets. So yeah, so I deal with a lot of water data using um, the program. Thank you. Uh, online participants are having a little trouble hearing, so if we could just speak a little bit loudly, if you can, it's okay. Hi, um, my you. name is David. Um, as an undergrad, I was a math and a good amount of physics guy, but in more recent years, I've been more in the realm of public policy and lawmaking. So these days, I'm sort of trying to bridge both of those worlds together and just get like science people and decision makers, boss people in the government in the same room just talking to each other about these critical issues. Um, when I was a kid, a, a senior in high school, um, I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of New York State. Uh, most of my life has been in New York City, but at the time I was living um, just an hour north of here. Um, but when I was a senior in high school, that's when Hurricane Sandy hit 11 years ago. So for me, uh, water as a natural disaster is a, a very visceral 
thing. And of course, being here in New York City now, we just said the floods last Friday. So uh, both from just like a person who lives here and as someone uh, who works with a lot of public policy people, this is um, uh, very, you know, topical and serious matter. And I just want to get as many, um, you know, voices on so we can collectively fix this problem. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zini and I'm from the University of Canada and my major is GIS. And when I came to this um, workshop, because I found there are two of that, um, that made me very interested. The first one is I, because I'm interested in the education and curriculum design. And I this um, is also focused on open science and that affects me. Uh, because I have done some um, yeah, curriculum and sustainability education. And the second one is the water resource model. And I'm for this semester, I'm a first year PhD student, and this semester I work on a project that's about the social vulnerability for um, really public roads. That in the in Iowa, um, but I have I'm doing the um, comprehensive literature review this time with this, and I found from actually I'm new in this area, and I found some uh, topic that that's very uh, a little different from uh, what you are reading. Yeah, uh, share and the pollution uh, contaminants there are mainly the E. coli and the nitrogen uh, because of the um, farm and um, the people and agriculture business. So I find that very different from uh, that different areas. So uh, it's very interesting to me and I want to know more about this topic so how to this reading the function. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Lauren and I joined today because kids <laughs> and I also work with Manu, who's the the, uh, the PI for Lai And my relationship to water, um, it was really before I started in high school. I met someone at the uni no, sorry, before I started university in physics. I met someone in hydrogeology that will be that was practical to develop models to simulate water politics. And said, so, yes, I want to design video games for real life. So that was my <laughs> Uh, I'm Jeff, University of Wyoming. Um, interested in iGUIDE's work on this. Uh, we have an NSF uh, score project at the University of Wyoming uh, called uh, Wyoming um, Anticipating Climate Transition. So really thinking about sort of the spatiotemporal aspects of water and really snow as water and sort of that relationship, you know, in, in the West where so much of our use of water is tied to the timing of, of snow melt <laughs> and, and, and thinking of it that way. And of course we have issues with, with data scarcity and quality and, and correctness as well. So, um, so I guess that's why I'm here. Um, you know, just personally, I always have had a connection to rivers no matter uh, where I live. Um, just one uh, sort of small thing that I just experienced last week. Um, my uh, my mother grew up on at uh, Lake Itasca State Park, which uh, is the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And uh, when the Mississippi River leaves that lake, um, it's about as half as wide as this room, <laughs> probably. Uh, and so I was at a connection to that because because of you know the that our family had a tie there. And then for the first time last week, I visited New Orleans and um, sort of saw the Mississippi River more than 2,000 miles downstream. And it really kind of struck me. So I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> really, it really kind of struck me like um, sort of the connectedness uh, that rivers provide and, you know, and how people there are still talking about Katrina, you know, 20 years later. And yeah, it was, it was very impactful. And, and water is very impactful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Kayla. Um, I work at Truman, and um, I guess like my personal connection to water, uh, uh, we were really impacted by the rain last week. Uh, but where I'm from in Colorado, uh, 
like locked in black water in the same way. But uh, it's like very different to the other kinds of, of graphs that you saw on the side of them. So just, I really appreciate what you're saying about the interconnected nature of water. Oh. Thanks. I want to work part time at season and I'm also a master student. Um I grew up in New York City, so it's pretty fortunate to have access to New York City tap water, which I think is at least the best I've tried. Not by itself. Um but uh my family lives in Greece and I think from like an early age I recognize that clean water is not as accessible as it is for or that it was for me growing up, and I was really fortunate for that. So I was pretty aware from young age that water quality was not um, widespread. So, Linda. Uh, so my name is Linda Lacey. I'm not part of the season group here working on the project. Um, I have kind of a personal relationship with water, and I kind of something that's a bit more political. Uh, I live in Rockland County, New York. I'm a birder. I've always just been drawn to wetlands mainly because of the birds that we find there. So also not, I you know, they're very far from the river, so I tend to go there a lot. There's a lot of locations where there's a lot of birding. So I've always been drawn to water in that context. Uh, also in Rockland County, it's one of the smallest counties in the state, and all of the water that is, you know, available in the, to the residents um, is what falls within the county. So there's no river that runs into the county. There's a river that runs sort of along the edge into New Jersey. Um, but so water is an issue and there's a lot of political pressure to develop there. Um, in fact, there's a lot of what most would consider overdevelopment. Um, and so water is becoming a very political issue. There was some pressure to build a detail plant a little while ago and there was, you know, this kind of shot down, but I think it's just a matter of time before that option comes up again. So two different sides of water for me. Yeah, hi, I'm Diva. Um, I'm from the University of Illinois. Um, and I work uh, in I rhythm, I like uh, on data ethics. Um, so my interest in comes to this session um, is to really learn more about um, some of the uh, ethical issues involved both in sort of access and collection and use of data and also in how um, the outputs um, from say, modeling is used to inform policy and decision making. Um, and also to think about how um, ethics uh, can be integrated with education. Um, my relationship to water, um, I grew up um, on the south coast in England um, in like a little uh, coastal community. Um, so water was very important there um, in terms of well, the economy basically depended on it. Um, King George, um, the King of lost America. Mm -hmm. It was his vacation spot, so he um, used to come down. And then now I live um, in Illinois, which is a thousand miles away from the coast. So it really made me realize how what I've missed and uh, how you can't take it for granted. Thanks. Yeah, I would love to hear from you and learn from you about how we can make sure what we're developing it embeds ethics through and through is definitely that that's a goal for us uh so for our online participants again you know the question really is what what is your experience or relationship with water and you know secondarily what inspired you to come to the workshop uh Haseem, could you start us off or Hugh and I'll come back to Haseem yeah, hi. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is Hill. I used to intern at CISIN, so my relationship with water is I grew up in Vietnam, where the clean water sources very, like, I would say inaccessible because it's very much, it's too much in the rainy season and very little in dry season. And we have, a, we have the flood situation very severe and the it has mentioned before that the water resources are very inaccessible because very polluted. And I'm interested in learning more about water. Maybe to oh. Yeah, sorry about that, Hugh. Um it's all. Yeah, J J Josh. 
Sure, I'm here. Hi, my name is Josh, I'm a research scientist with iSciences. Um, I'm very interested in open science and water resources and work in that field. So uh, the topic is uh, prescient to me, but I, I'm a collaborator on this project. So that's mainly why I'm here. But uh, my personal relationship to water, um, I grew up in West Michigan and actually recently moved back after many years. And um, so I, I grew up on the dunes and uh, playing in the, <clears throat> on the beach. And so I have a strong kind of nostalgic connection to those ecosystems and preser preserving them and monitoring them and the development of them and all. We have lots of water issues in West Michigan with, uh, with sharing water with other states or Nestle sucking it dry or, you know, go on and on. So uh, both a, a nostalgic, a kind of a citizen's local taxpayer approach and then also uh, research uh, connections to water. So through and through for as with many here, I'm guessing. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Jenny? Thanks, Kit. I'm Jenny Hewson. I'm with NASA's Earth Sciences Division. I actually collaborate with Chris, with Kit on um, an open science set of activities across NASA's Data Active Archive Centers, or DACs, which you may be familiar with. And as far as my relationship with water, so prior to working for um, for NASA, I worked on a, in a number of developing countries, and uh, this always reminded me of what we take for granted in terms of readily drinkable water in certainly much of the US and certainly in the UK, uh, where I'm from. Thank you, Jenny. Tom, would you like to speak about your relationship with water? Sure. Um, so my, my first response to this question sort of mirrors Jenny's. Um, my relationship with water has been extraordinarily privileged. Um, I've typically lived in areas that are relatively water abundant, but uh, with uh, you know, solid infrastructure for flood control and, um, and drinking water. So I, I, you know, on a daily basis, for the most part, I haven't had to worry about water too much, uh, except professionally. Um, but more recently, there have been a couple of exceptions to that. So my primary residence is in Vermont, um, where uh, we've had two major flooding episodes um, of record, uh, one in 2011 with Irene that wiped out uh, whole communities and isolated others for, for uh, you know, on the order of a month of time where there's, uh, you know, ATV access only. Um, and then the other is I, I work part-time in Northern Virginia and have an apartment uh, there. Uh, it's in an older building that's being renovated and in a, in a portion of, of Northern Virginia that apparently doesn't have very reliable infrastructure. So it seems like uh, on average, a couple days of month, we have emergency shutoffs in the, in the building. Uh, which uh, are uh, unpleasant um, to, to deal with. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Hashim? Okay. Uh, Emmanuel, the question was, what, what is your experience or relationship with water? And, you know, feel free to introduce yourself also. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll yes. come back to you, Hashim. Okay. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, go ahead. And thank you for the explanation because I could just rejoin. Well, my my relationship with what well, I'm uh, from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and you know it's a quite quite interesting situation that the the whole city is built up, um, let's say almost facing against the water instead of uh, op be open. Uh, and benefit from the fact that we can uh, develop a, a city that faced the a huge river, Rio de la Plata. And the, um, well, the urban planning was completely offset in that regard. And the other relation is, is that um, Buenos Aires is served by one of the most of the one of the largest uh, water bodies in the in the world, right, in South America, but we already don't we already know very little about that. So that's why I joined this seminar uh, with uh, great enthusiasm to to know how these uh, issues, water issues, are explored. 
Thank you. Hashim? Hello, my name is Hashim Engin. I am from season. I am a GS specialist. So my relation to water uh, in a two ways. Uh, first one, I am from Turkey and the, the area that I live is mostly mountains. So we had a lot of snow, also water. And the area that I live are the areas that have the cleanest water in Turkey. And this is why the water is very important for us. Second, the water is part of our culture. And we have a lot of religionally or culturally, we have a lot of rituals with the water. So water is kind of one of the things that in our culture a lot. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. No, thank you, Hashim. It was very interesting. Uh, Nancy? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. So to address the two questions, I think really the last couple of speakers kind of echo um, my relationship to water, which actually started at a very young age. I learned to swim when I was about three. And water for me up till I became a professional has really been one that um, connects me to the aesthetic and to the spiritual and to literature and to art and to many things that I find are really quite um, quite fulfilling in, ter in human terms. Um, but I also became very aware of, of the absence of those things to many, many people on the planet. And so of late, um, my work has been te in teaching and research around uh, water issues and Kit's invitation and Laura Lynn, with whom I work uh, on the NSF grant and on TAPS, is um, the fulfillment of really um, looking at how to connect all these things that are part of my being, but also part of my intellectual um, engagement and hopefully service, service to the people around me um, through education um, and also contribution. Thanks so much, Nancy. Uh, last but not least is Deborah Balk, who's also serving as a subject matter expert for us on human impacts related to, to, to water data. So Deborah, feel free to start off by talking about your relationship, uh, but then you can share your screen afterwards and dive into your presentation. Great. Thanks. Nice to be with you all. Sorry I missed most of the earlier session. Um, I am... Um, <clears throat> yes, I, um, so my relationship with water, well, you know, I have, um, um, had the fortunate experience of living in both water rich and water scarce environments, um, and some of the water rich environments I've lived in have, are, include places like Bangladesh, which, uh, it's like water abundant and water too abundant, um, as well as New York State, but also places like California, which are water scarce. And so, um, you know, I, um, and that's both, you know, perspectives from the global north and the global south. So I, um, even when I lived in Bangladesh, I always had access to clean water. So um, I, um, for example, so, um, you know, I, I think, um, and as uh, you will learn in a minute, I, first of all, I, I want to apologize for the presentation I'm going to share with everybody today. <laughs> not not because it's, um, I, I mean, I, 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 I love the work that I'm going to present, but it's, um, I think that you're going to think, wow, what does this have to do with water? So, I mean, I heard, I caught a little bit of Laura Linton's presentation and, you know, on lead and that was like fantastic, right? And um, so this is going to be a much like, higher overview, but my, as a career wise, or so I've also had the good fortune of being able to pay attention to things like where do cities get their water and what does that mean? Um, and so, um, and cities get their water from a variety of places, sometimes groundwater, sometimes um, a whole variety of resources. And as we grow, I'm, I'm a, in, by way of introduction, I'm the, um, I'm, I'm a professor at the Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College and at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I'm the director of the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research. And I get to spend a lot of time thinking about population and its interface with the environment. And so in that context, you know, 
I, I use a lot of like survey and census data and um, to help illuminate some of these issues. But increasingly, it's especially like when you reflect even just last week on the flooding that we had, our data infrastructure is not either from the our data infrastructure on the geophysical side, as well as on the social and behavioral science or health science side, we're not really well equipped to be answering questions about flooding in urban areas, for example. We just aren't. We um, we don't collect data with hourly hourly behavioral data, let alone uh, daily or uh, yearly data for the most part. Most of our data infrastructure is um, primed at, a, 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 at longer intervals and at spatially coarser uh, resolutions. And I think that really for a lot of water resource issues, that is going to be problematic. And then this is, I think, a little bit paralleled, although there's a lot of been a lot of advance on understanding how and where flooding happens. But again, pairing these things together becomes really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, but what I, what we're gonna so and I can share my screen and um, I am going to talk about work that I've had the um, good fortune of um, um, of uh, um, oops, I didn't share my screen. I just started my presentation. You know, you'd think, is that even <laughs> possible like in today's Zoom? Okay, here we go. Fine. Can you see my screen large? I see so, it. So, okay, great. So I'm talking about work that uh, preparing for the rising tide. It's really on how we come up with population exposure change and prospects of living in low-lying coastal areas. So this is putting, and so the water resource here that we're talking about is the coastal zone. <laughs> and that's a water resource, because, why? Because most as most cities of the world have, find themselves living near um, uh, the water's edge, whether it's a coastal area or a riverine area. And there are like long historical reasons for that. And um, so, um, and so I, I guess like, so I'm gonna take this bird's eye view and uh, for, and Kit, give me, if you wanna give me like a 10 minute warning, I'll just speed through these. I have more slides here than I can get through. I, um, but um, these, some of these, um, um, and I'm happy to answer questions on how these data, these kinds of data could be retrofit for more local quest, local areas. And I think about this issue and so forth. But um, let me just talk about like, this is the reason, one of the reasons this is emblematic is that this work that I'm talking about today started more than 15 years ago. I had the good fortune of working with colleagues at season. I myself was at season with Kit um, and others and Alex who, and in the room. And, and um, so several of my co-authors on some of the work I'm presenting, Haseem as well, are part of this. But um, the story about why this took 15 years is an interesting one. So just like, um, right, we all understand, every, if you're in this room, you know, we have both, un we live in an uncertain century, but let me just pause for a moment to say what is certain. So we have climate change is certain. And demographically, we have urbanization is on the rise, right? The bulk of, it's not just on the rise, but the bulk of the future growth of the world's population will take place in the cities and towns of um, mostly Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but even in places like the United States, where we're largely, you know, more than uh, three quarters urban, will still become somewhat more urban. You might pause and say, what does it mean to be urban? And that's a really good question. Does it mean you live in one of the five boroughs of New York or you live up the quote unquote upstate um, where season is located um, or <laughs> um, according to some people that would be upstate or do you have to go a couple more counties northward to get upstate and so forth. So what does urbanization look like is a good question. And then uh, and it will also we will more certainly become an, um, an older population and these things are relevant for understanding population exposures. Um, so the sim here are the simple questions we tried to answer. How many people live in low-lying areas at risk of seaward hazards? How many of the city dwellers live in such areas? Have we um, been adapting to coastal hazards by moving away from them? Is growth in these low-lying areas more, less, or about the same as in such areas as it has been in the past 25 years? And um, are these, um, you know, and are risks evenly distributed across this zone, say by geographical features? Or are the risks to populations evenly distributed by place and by population characteristics? So I think you would all, you might all um, uh, recognize that the, none of these, uh, these don't sound like they're earth shattering questions, right? But um, believe it or not, um, you know, to get the answers to those simple questions, it required interdisciplinary approaches, it required spatial framework, it required starting simply and making assumptions really clear for other people to come along and say, yeah, oh, we can do better. 
and for a community of scholarship to improve it. And it's resulted in description, not even like causal questions for like why, well, to answer the why, but just the what. So, and so we developed this low elevation coastal zone, which just looks like this. It's uh, here's a simple method. It's uh, underlying this is very fine to the extent possible, fine scale census data. This is Southern Vietnam. I understand there is at least one Vietnam, Vietnam born um, participant in the room. So um, here we have Southern, the South, Southern portion of Vietnam. These are administrative data. We overlay it with uh, a rendering of uh, urban areas. For simplicity's sake, I'm just showing the global uh, rural urban mapping project data though uh, called Grump, which lives at season, but is not updated uh, any longer. And that was based on nighttime lights. And then we overlay it with a shuttle radar topography mission based uh, uh, um, data, which allowed us to estimate elevation, coastal um, proximate to coast. And this is, um, so I will use the term LECZ. Um, and this is uh, 10 meters contiguous to sea coast. So we did this work in um, two, uh, about 15 years ago. And um, Kit and uh, Haseem and I and other colleagues updated it in um, in uh, now two years ago, and um, you and all these data that get transformed to regular regular units like a quadrilateral grid and some of you like gridded population data, and then we just do a very simple kind of um, overlay a zonal statistic in GIS parlance. And then that lets us take it back into more policy type units. And it at that point, we estimated for the first time that one in 10 persons lives in low lying coastal zone. And so, um, and here each color is a continent and each, um, and these are millions of persons and most people with any land area in the LECZ have their largest city in it. So people are exposed. And if you live in a city, you are among them. <laughs> Uh, small island states and deltaic countries and their cities are much higher risk, um, and that was part of the motivating force for doing this work to understand small island states. But importantly, whereas it's only one in 10 persons, it's one in eight urban dweller lives in the LACZ. And again, back to the other point I made that city dwellers in Africa and Asia are disproportionately at risk, and it, that's really important because most of the future growth of the world's population will take place in, in the cities and towns of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So we went ahead and created these new estimates and here they are. Why did we bother updating? I'm not gonna, um, uh, much, much improved data in terms of rendering the low elevation coastal zone based on elevation data products. Um, and it also allows us for distinguishing people at higher risk, those living only up to five meters as opposed to those living at five to 10 meters. Um, and then we have improvements to population data. There are now not one. Uh, when this was done, there was basically two population data sets that could have been used in this sort of family of gridded population data sets. And now there are four. Uh, and then, um, and there have also been really big uh, improvements in understanding the urban proxy, not just Grump, but there are a whole suite of data sets that allow us. And this also allows us to distinguish more so an urban continuum, not just urban or rural. So I don't wanna spend time on this, but here is a yeah, picture that, of each that, of these. So it's a four by four by four. You can do the math. And so many data choices. And it sorry looks to, like sorry this. To sorry to jump in, Deborah. So I'll give you a seven minute warning. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not gonna, this is what it looks like. I'm just gonna walk through that. That, that was the, the zone itself. This is the urban areas with people at risk and this is population. And um, data choices really matter. If we were making a website for people to use, we would make those all very clear. We got um, our, um, the new results that we got confirmed our original findings, but importantly, it places many more urban residents in the LECZ, nearly 15% of the urban centers and another 10% of people who live in these area that's in between urban and rural that we don't exactly know what they are. And then similarly, we know amongst places that um, that split is more half and half among these like rural areas and places that are like cities and towns as opposed to urban centers. So those places may not be um, adapting the same way that urban centers historically have adapted where the lion's share of their populations, I mean, more is it this higher zone five to 10 rather than the zero to five meter. So um, um, I, again, I'm gonna pass on the details, but the importance here is that the sensitivity analysis is that um, that the elevation zones make a difference. 
the population data sets make a difference, but the elevation data sets that go into the LECZ matter more than the population. They're more sensitive to the how you measure the LECZ. And let me just point out that they mostly agree on where the edges of the LECZ are, but they don't agree in between the lower and higher risk zones within that, the up to five to ten and um, up to five and five to ten. And then depending upon the way you measure urbanization, um, we'll give you different results on how concentrated the population and how urban the population is within the LECZ. So these things could really matter for one's measurement. Um, but again, now that was the differences. And I would argue that fitness of use and why you pick a particular data set matters. But I wanna point out that all of these places change over time. Urban areas have experienced the greatest increase in population from 1990 to 2015, but um, they are the, but the urban areas within the LECZ have grown faster than those outside of it. And 75% of the urban increase in the LECZ versus you know less than 60% outside of it and that the population of these urban centers like cities um, um, are in the zero to five meter LECZ, the highest risk zone that's growing fastest of all, importantly, and the global averages are, di are driven by Asian cities. Okay, so data choices matter and they can lead to different estimates. Consistency and estimation also though, that's really important takeaway message that despite the differences we see that and fitness for use matters. Okay, now I probably have five minutes left to speed through the rest of this. So let me yeah. tell you that we went from global to regional. Yeah. This is another paper that came out last week. So I'm uh, sorry, I didn't update that slide. <laughs> and we added deltas to this. So we added on another data set and that allows us to account. If, if what we just saw was deep concentrations in the LECC, we see even deeper concentrations of people in the deltaic areas. So these slides are very colorful and very pretty and we can make them available to you and you can see them all, but I'm gonna just go to the, they really are beautiful, right? Uh, uh, our, our collaborators uh, <clears throat> participated in making those part of our uh, research team made them in the really nice kit. Uh, Haseem is one of the, the makers of those graphics as well as um, Matt, who's probably not in the room, but here's the takeaway. So um, deltas uh, further concentrate the exposure in the LECZ, and it's especially there, um, they can train these high concentrations, both of population and built up area. And the built up is really important. Think again about our flood that we had last week. We're putting up high buildings and we need sewer sewage pipes or drainage pipes to take the water that these cities experience in a large storm out of the city if they experience it. The, and furthermore, a lot of these cities are in deltas in, um, they're in deltaic areas of Asia. Uh, and these deltas, deltas may also, um, I, um, it's precarious because the urbanization, the last point here, it's sinking as well uh, through groundwater extraction, sedimentation loss and other physical processes. Ones that if you're not doing work in an integrated framework, you're not gonna pay attention to. Um, and so that is that. Now you might think I'm done, but I'm going to for a minute go to the US. This is yet another paper, but in this case, we moved away from using the global data and we used the US uh, census blocks for four decades, 90, 2000, 2010, 2020. And we created similar thing uh, estimates. And um, of the 3000 counties in the lower 48 states, uh, 390 of them have any land area and roughly 34 million people. So it's one in six person in those um, counties and it lives in this low elevation coastal zone, but it's even more concentrated with only 5% of the population exposure in the top 25 counties. And I should just point out that the, okay, we see Florida and Florida, right? And then three, the first three counties are Florida, but the next county is, this is uh, Brooklyn and then followed by Queens. And then here we have, um, keep going and um, here's uh, Nassau County and Long Island. Uh, we have all of the, we have, I think, and here we have Suffolk, no, that's Suffolk, Massachusetts. Anyhow, we have, oh yeah, here, here is Manhattan and here's Suffolk County, New York. So we get um, four of the, we get a lot of both Long Island counties plus uh, four, three of the five um, New York City counties are in the top 25. And so New York City, you know, you know, you think Hurricane Sandy, but and last week's flooding, but we are at risk of these coastal seaward hazards as well. Um, and exposures, when you use something like uh, the high resolution census data that's uh, rich with th themes, you know that you can then begin to look at expo ex exposures by differing by vulnerability. And in the U.S., um, I think I'm just going to go to the last, like housing is complicated. 
Uh, race and ethnicity is really important here. Black residents have the highest share of population in urban and rural LACZ with one out of every five black urban residents living in the LACZ. And Hispanics were the only po uh, po subpopulation with positive growth in all areas. But then housing really complicates that because white householders are more likely than black and Hispanic householders own homes with the, own the LACZ. But because renters and homeowners face much different constraints, um, in response to say a disaster, um, it really, you have to unpack who's owning and who's renting and where, whether it's urban or rural and so forth. Um, and then, oh, I neglected that um, primarily by the growth of urban population all the way at the top, this zone increased in um, 20, from 22 to 31 million. And in the last 20 years alone, the urban population grew consistently at higher rates inside the LECZ than outside of it, reversing the pattern from prior decade. So if you hear that people are going to move away from the low from this like these coastal zones, I think you can say, well, the evidence is, you know, the our future trends are um, best predicted by past trends, and there's not a lot of evidence of this right now. The evidence is people are moving toward toward this uh, vulner water vulnerable, otherwise coastal climate at risk seaward hazards zone of high vulnerable, you know, high potential exposures. Um, it's also aging faster. That's the takeaway. I won't go into the details there. And um, and consistent with um, other studies on population change, people tend not to move very far. So when you move out of the zone, you don't move to a like a much different kind of area. You just move as close as you possibly can. So you may put yourself at risk of, you know, that not the next disaster, but a disaster in 10 years or 20 or 30 years. Or you may leave, if you're a home lucky enough to be a homeowner, you may leave that asset. Uh, to somebody who's going to have to move later on. So uh, concluding here, um, the main research results are all ev all evidence is that the this resource, like the population exposure is disproportionately urban and that cities have grown faster in uh, urban areas in the LACZ than outside of it. So, um, but it's heterogeneous, uh, deltaic dominance in Asia, not so much in the US. Um, and so, a lot remains unanswered. We don't really understand the causes of this growth. I mean, like unpacking it demographically, say by migration or urbanization, migration or land expansion, migration versus natural increase or land expansion. And those kind of answers would help in understanding like climate um, adaptation and mitigation. And this LECZ that we I described here, we use sort of like a what's called a bathtub model, and maybe it's outlived its utility. And so making resources like this available for people to look at and to continue to poke away at and find improvements is, I think, really valuable. Like let somebody come along and say, that's not good enough and develop a new one. And it isn't good enough, like especially if we want to understand the kind of flooding we've had. So there are actually improved measures of actual flooding and expected flood exposure would be really helpful. Um, and flooding exposure may have as much to do with social factors like housing and governance. And those issues we don't really collect in a deep way in our social and health type surveys, which allow us to ask how people interface with their water. Um, and so that is something that we all have to like. So there's both improvements on the physical and the social side. Um, Importantly, I know we're talking today about water resources, but this approach can be used with any spatially delineated hazards like heat or drought, wildfires. Um, remote, notably, the remote sensing and environmental data are much more um, available and easier to use, but they're still not easy to use if you're like used to working in tables. So, um, and measures of vulnerability and demographic change come from censuses and surveys. And I think we have to prepare to make them a little bit more accessible within an interdisciplinary setting and with the spatial and it was mostly the temporal demands of that that are not really present in those um, data collections. Some hazards are intrinsically harder to study like storm paths and local flooding. So we have to think of new ways to capture this information. And it's not clear to me that we're gonna capture it through physical observation. We might need social information to do that. And then similarly, like as we heard earlier today, you know, climate justice, justice principles are really important here as well as de democratizing data. And so how can, um, and are these data being used? We have to ask that question, are they being used um, uh, as well as, you know, who has access to using them? Um, I think we have to move beyond description. Um, we have to enhance it and move beyond it. And we have to call out where we're where we have the opportunity for improvement in our national statistical infrastructures and refit them for the 21st century and move away, you know, really recognize that it's 2020. So we don't need the data structures of the 20 of 20 of year 2000. We need to move that toward 2100. 
and um, use place-based findings to help improve our understanding of causal processes behind vulnerability and these demographic components of change. And I think that's my last slide, but shout out to in the room, um, Haseem and uh, Kit are in the room and other collaborators, including many students um, and funders who helped us do this work. And I hope I'm still at time. Thanks for having me. I will, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, so you didn't go over time very much, so I appreciate that. Oh, thanks, Kit, you're too sweet. That's like, uh, very much is like, okay, Yes. You could have cut me off. I'm sorry. I didn't I, have time to, I meant to set my, I tried to set my phone for, you know, whatever. And I didn't. I, I can't, do, I can't do that. But, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so, no, thank you. Uh, so, you know, we've heard so many interesting presentations today that shows like the, the, the wide range of directions that we can go in for this project. So in the last 40 minutes, I want to break out into two groups so that m more people get a chance to talk. Uh, you know, we'll have breakout rooms for the online participants that, you know, you'll you'll also be able to join one of the two groups that are in the room. Uh, I'm going to throw this link in the chat again. Uh, the link for folks in the room is, is in bit.ly on the whiteboard. And, you know, th there are there are many more questions in this document than we'll ever be able to answer. But there's a lot of food for thought, so we'll just let the the working groups naturally evolve into which questions that they want to speak about. Uh, so let's move on to that. We, you know, we'll just go into two clusters here in the room. Uh, I'm going to create the breakout group breakout rooms. Uh, I had four here, but I don't need four. So Linda and Camilla, are you okay to, or or Juan could? Yeah, I'll put this in. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open these rooms, and then I'm going to assign people randomly. But uh, you know, actually, let me do this again. Sorry about that. You wanna add me? I want to say recreate, and I want to let ch participants choose their room. So. You know, if you're an online participant, you can you can figure out which group is going to work best for you. I'll open them now, and you know, please self self assign. Uh, you know, in both groups, we're going to take all of the questions and see where the conversation goes. Uh, we're only breaking down so that more people have a chance to talk. So one group will be here. This other room. If you're an online participant, you should be able to choose which room to join. I did join, but nothing happened. You're not, I could assign you. So I'll put you in room two. Okay, Kit, sorry. What's the difference between room one and room two? I forget. I know you have it in a Google there, there, thing. There, there's no difference except it's just breaking us into smaller groups so more people have a chance to talk. Okay, fine. Thanks, Kit. You're in two and you're in room one. Yes. Great. Right. Okay, so yeah but you could drift in and out it's okay like you could you can join and then switch rooms if you need to I, i'll come help <laughs> Sorry if that was unclear. For over time, I got a little nervous. I was like, oh, we got to break into groups. Do somebody want to come over here? Yeah, let them come. I have candy over here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> I forgot about the candy, but we do want to encourage people to talk with candy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, if they just throw the punches. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll start with um, <laughs> when you have a few questions. If you don't yeah. right. uh, you're sitting right in. Um, I'm sorry. Can you start with Yeah, I'll start with uh, kind of right when they start. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Any uh, yeah. Yeah. questions yeah. that you have? Yeah. You can just click store. Um, if you want to. I mean, that's, uh, I'd say one thing maybe we're thinking about how, um, maybe it's not how the output should be, but we're going to see the information. Because it was interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I'm still trying to find the right screen here. Uh, one of the things that came through the presentation is how, uh, yeah, you can choice it about data. We have a set of questions. Um, but you know, what we're um, so it'd be interesting to think about what somebody, um, yeah, say a policy maker who is you know, handed the results of uh, an analysis, what do they need to know about the analysis? I do. I mean, there's lots to unpack with what you just said, right? You know, like, yeah, no, I, is using, I is using, you know, best available data, you know, like, okay, even though that data might not be, you know, <laughs> as accurate as you want, or yes, I learned as you want, or something I often repeat from Lee Schwartz to, you know, for the State Department is the acronym for best available data, BAD. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, you know. You know, and how do you communicate uncertainty when you're, you know, turning data into information? I mean, there's, yeah, those are all yeah. like real world dilemmas with, with <laughs> you know, sharing data, using data, making decisions about whether to use data. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you can use data in your data center. Yeah. 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 Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, like you think of all the, you know, web maps and, and dashboards that we have put up there and how many of them actually communicate the uncertainty of the data. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't do a very good job of that. And if we do, it's maybe not in a way that's understandable by the intended audience. But we have so what they're doing, I think that's a way to explain uncertainty. Um, yeah. because oftentimes I, I don't a lot of I do within a lot of areas work on daily uh academic research questions that I mean mainly work at apply and consulting. And my external uh, stakeholders uh, 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 and it's not enough just to um, explain the moment without getting a point that's meant to people who are working outside of that line, essentially, essentially, and they might be familiar with your needs, but they're not sure if you the immigration or supply or water script issue. But uh, it's not everything to the technical or statistical uh, modeling aspect of what you're doing. Uh, to uh, get that number of that kind of jumping factor in any really don't have a lot of explaining a certain way to hire, they might not be comfortable 
um, data for doing okay, so you're now saying regardless of what the use case uh, is, information it should be uh, built into the model uh, that it, 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 a location, an area study that a study area that people can use to them. Yeah, so we have a lot of people who 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 have a lot of people is have you seen any I examples or have you, you know any ways that you've seen that have you know kind of successfully communicated um, this information certain uh, in an effective way, um, with a slight maybe not specific to water, but maybe in those projects that, are, that you could think of that you know, remember, oh, this is a great way to communicate this important information or to communicate this uh, service. Like another, like in short, Jim and I'm on why you're writing the writing, so if you want to sort of learn to write out it, you'll be able to that. But if you don't want to, you can just simply call it. So uh, super easy, you can transfer it into any use case. Yeah, so you uh, can have the uh, researchers and people developing that curriculum to the floor of, you know, to be courageous about you know, certain um, things that you need to know. Of course, you know, it's clearly a very important I I would always remember um, working with a group of teachers and scientists who came in and forget the scientific method. Um, so I swear, very hard to workshop and your community colleges. And I was studying the beliefs in the room, um, but I have to be very open to the possibility of background and all the agents are in a way that was there. So, you know, teach them how to do it. I think it's different. I love it. Like, you call it the top of the region or the top area number. And the job is that in the end, they still get my assumption is that it's about driving towards solutions. But if you're in space, you know, education and the inquiry process and, and uh, being engaged with people who have this from all different ways that the certainty is uncomfortable but it's it's so important to to really um reveal because I don't know yeah, I'm the I'm the one that 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 I'm the one what do you think um, are some of the ways you know, that you know, researchers can college become college more comfortable college college with the Zoom um, service? And how can researchers, or if anybody wants to jump in, please do a discussion. How can researchers feel comfortable explicitly saying, hey, this is uncertain? and I'm sharing this with you because um, we're doing science. And so I, I have to her so that reservation of hesitation to, to share data because of uh, this fear that people are going to be wrong. <laughs> and so how do we uh, have these conversations with researchers and tell them, like, hey, it's, it's OK to be wrong because, um, like you said, science is meant. For me, in my experience, and, that's good. Uh, I'm finished. And, also, my experience is water that rise, that the water that rise is so bad. So that means that your big confidence would be they have an example in that case. And in general, like if you have a metric, that's very hard to convince a different metric, an indicator or something like this. But the minute you get into a quantity, the number of people that are exposed or the number of centimeters of sea level rise, you very quickly think of a, a yeah, new confidence balance. And you don't care. And this is really where I'm like, going to be the actual yeah. measure that we care yeah. about, we uh, whether it is dollars yeah. or sort of things. Yeah. This is where you see like the rounding yeah. that matters. Yeah. And you'll give yeah. this yeah. interval yeah. so that you yeah. represent yeah. something. And maybe it's, well, it's the opposite, yeah. which is being yeah. provocative yeah. there, yeah. is that yeah. if we also yeah. include yeah. the notion yeah. of liability, yeah. um, there's a lot of things that I've seen happen is that people's researchers have no liability with what they're proposing. 
And, and so then there's no consequences. You're more at risk. And for the sake of pushing the message that you care about, you're not going to be robust or conservative or only sure. And this is where I think it's a bad practice. And, and I, because of a lot of frustration on my side, you know, to be honest, <laughs> really, really disappointed. And so you think, I think each time you go back to the purpose and you think of, you know, I still want to say, well, it wasn't let free. So really I've never said that. I say it's unlikely, and yeah, this is why in the transparent part of the process. And this is the um, the threshold. Does the threshold matter? It depends on who you are. And if you really think for the purpose, you go back to the uh, technical skills. I mean, generally, on any issue, the legislature is using why else and Actually, quite um, easy. You know, it's a very problem. You saw that play out in real time. You know, maybe they saw this that they're going to say, hey, you know, here are not the right answers. And I think it goes to like, um, like, sensitivity analysis, also something. So, time series is very easy to hear about from uh, uh, folks, like right? If you see the bend, uh, the 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 when you do spatial, uh, educating uh, this is a lot harder. Right? Because cross sections or something like this. But if you Friday think about the numbers, you can do sensitivity analysis. You can say, go back and change your mind about this and this. Yes. You know, when, when it comes happens, to having like a see visual and the rest of the see how they vary. But but this is the power of people to bring their numbers in that context. Do sensitivity uh, analysis, feel the confidence uh, that this is what matters or not. And this is how you can make recommendations. Uh, not in terms of this, you need to resolve that uncertainty here on my data uh, recommendations. It, it, it's as if you're you know, suggesting that the white not about completely um, your state providing uncertainty or being um, about being in terms of whether uh, agency uh, uh, have understanding and knowing how to use not, tools. Um, um, yeah, uh, and it's where if you read the open science perspective, uh, is the uh, open data, but then the open tool is behind so that people can conduct the sensitivity analysis, right? So if there's large machinery and you're not redoing all of the data sets, you cannot recompute. <laughs> the confidence interval is more, you cannot be held accountable. You know, the value of, I guess that there's a kind of a value of right? Yeah, then, you know, on, on the flip side, how can they take what they're learning and maybe maybe they're discovering things that they and then share it out to maybe social media platforms and that's maybe a kind of way and think there's spreading word about what they're bringing up the language of data and revealing what the language is and what it means and and why it's been developed in the way it has and it's how the um the act of embracing uncertainty has has allowed for these mechanisms to try and deal with it but but I think it's asynchronous online you're always going to be uncertain yeah you can start to talk the video. For me, it's a really powerful sharing of ways of thinking about somewhat elusive things to, to, to really say, this, this is, we deal with this all the time. This is how we we thought about it. These are the mechanisms that we use to try and, and um, uh, even it out. But, that you never come, open science is never about coming to a definitive answer, at least from my perspective. It, it's about coming to building knowledge and and um and promulgating knowledge and skills and and engagement. I don't know if that's all I'm really outside the world of the data and back. Laura, this whole time. But then I, one other thing to say, this is body about knowing. Um, I mean, it's about I had a knowledge base among undergrad people who are normally self selected to the data science. Arena. That's what my um, so very very kind of when from our own If I had been in positions earlier on, and you can't, I would have been very intrigued by it. There's and really no sense of my a classroom is drawn in and you might have such people out there. Yeah. Well, um, and well, and well, the diversity of the audience is something that I commend you all with. And 
I find it's that the current videos are very useful, but I feel like for me, sure. I'm just learning to learn a new classroom. I wonder really how better. useful the uh, yeah, comments and polls are by themselves. I guess they're like part of the bigger picture for these kind of problems with climate because there's so many other yeah, pieces of uncertainty. Yeah, so with how do we have any other problems like you know the data is pretty accurate and the model is pretty accurate. So your confidence in polls, the the real like values that manifest are gonna be like kind of accurate because like so in the variables but with problems with climate um yeah you've got the confidence intervals but ideally uh, or at least in the that research that I'm doing at the moment in any values that like that actually manifest into each other unlike these three in the confidence intervals because first of all the model is probably uh wrong for the theory on which um but the, I think also people need to be self selected. But it's been a period in which we examine the data. Um, and then we've got like the future projections as well. But then do because they how do we know that the climate dynamics are getting stable in the future? Could be the can't really, um, that could require it, but but much meaning on the research on those uh, content principles in terms of trying to. Okay. Like, yeah, it's taking to account for like the like that. Um, and then yeah, the data itself again is kind of bad. Um, or you've got the uncertainty with the station data, for example, if you're looking at precipitation. But then if you're using reanalysis data, then you've got uncertainty there as well. So um, yeah, I think confidence intervals are useful, but it's going to be part of the big picture with these kind of. And it's you can you can and say go back, right? So that's one complaint that I made at the talks last year at EGU. Yeah. And when I say, well, we have a data product of population that is off by three million for the state of California, yeah. and that's for current times. How come you don't have a disclaimer on saying hey? This is a data set that we produce them. Be cautious. You are off by 3 million for May for in 2022. And I think like, I'm trying to use the data, the data that is readily available. And so I think this is where we're going to say, like, this is what we estimated from this, the, the confidence intervals that we get from the GCMs that we're running for RCB 8.5, that no one agrees is a good idea. And you say, this is the confidence intervals that we have for last year, and this is by how all we were. Right? And, and right. to think, also, I'm playing like the GCM outputs. I'm not that bad. They're, Right. Well, what I was suggesting is that I mean, there seems to be not a lot of researchers that are comfortable and being that for, that, you know, for whatever, you know, fine finding. So I want to be fine to how we get help people research is comfortable saying, hey, we're, we're off by 3 million people. And it's a call pass. We're seeing the cost. Hey, this is, I think, I think good. We're seeing a caution, but in the pandemic, we're not going to use all cultural and experience, not wanting to do that, or not wanting to do that. And the challenges, I think that we need part of the science and the there is to somehow I standards to have it more and somehow teach people about confidence in the or about data uncertainty so that so that we become a little more comfortable. And we kind of start developing this language. And she's saying, yeah, but we don't have this uh, language that yeah, uh, we can create between policy and data factors. Yeah, what are the very distracting language enriched? Because, of course, you, know, you ask any data scientists what our confidence in it is, they, they can probably tell you what it is. But outside of that, Policymakers may not know what a confidence is, or someone who's researching about the community, or or a lot of people here are saying, "I um, don't learn how water affects affects you know my neighborhood." I don't think that. Um, how do we communicate that? Hey, we have this information, but you know, we may be off, but you should still use it. You know, how do you start having those conversations with people that? Don't put in a pen and expectations. So, that was a question I want to pose is how do we 
that bridged his personal so like, connection to water with these kinds of modern kinds of water ways in which that also has some. Um, well, I think that we see a lot is that the, 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 the in, in an unrobust assessment so that people will do, you so know, you will choose twice, and each time you have a sort of confidence that you hold that are produced, and then you and keep it like, and you do it with this. So there's a lot of a really a a systematic application of that uncertainty. And what's really interesting is really, for me, that's why I love as a scientist working in the is that I love the backward design, that you start by, I want to know whether I am going to empty my dam by not be prepared for that flood. I still have the decision to take. Right, so what I'm going to do is really, I want to say, well, what is happening if I do, what happens if I don't, and then that from that. Okay. And Usually, you say it's not a city official. How much does that is, cost? Okay, how many people are impacted? In a, you know, and this is where you know, we should be confident in the same. 21,737, point five. Because I've seen that, and also they have done in the humans. And this is not something that would complicate. I'm just going to do something that I do not understand. I'm not being the norm. Right? So this is where I think it's between 20 and 30,000 feedback. According to that data set, I use this one and see and go above or above 40. And I think that these are very other parameters to take into account. If you're comfortable with maybe you treat that for that example. And if you couldn't get into this, you have to. And there's so much more likely to be right. And I don't know why people don't want to be right, but they're completely wrong. I guess the, the incentive is not to be right, but to be right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to fight for any time. You don't want to fight for any time. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like one way to put that moment is yeah. like more traceability in the data so that folks can find like there are these estimates of where the confidence intervals are calculated from. And then if there was more water data, they can calculate more of these stuff that are being told about. Exactly. That's not. Um, are there any other ways besides like bridge traceability or or other ways that we can make make folks who are learning about this feel more confident in what they're doing? Because otherwise, that's what. We might just be handing folks who've never used big data like this, big data sets, and like, well, you might just pull something that's totally wrong out of this. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm like, I'm using it from um, the Department of Health official data, and mine is going to be 12 and five of schools. Right? So that's just the reality of that kind of data. Uh, but the work that I was doing is that a high school student is that there's no data. There's no data on that go by things. But there's proxies. You know, what, what and I think this is where I think mean, using Travis as a proxy is a first level of communicating. You know, so proxy is 0.9. Yeah. Well, as a proxy, yeah. I can use that, the, the, that tells me, and, and this is where I'm going to be. I'm going to be on online simulations where you look at all the classical physics experiments. Think about the audience here. And again, um, and it'd be it'd, it'd little, I believe um, that it's going to be the undergraduates in the general one, one letter and just like the philosophy and like that though it's fun. Um, it's also like, there's also a big thing to call into it as well. There's this video that happens in called University Box where you can like want to create a black hole. It's so clever. to make that happen. Um, or like what would happen if like the brain scanned it would be a what would happen then? Yeah, yeah, things like that. Yeah, so the ability to run these areas. Yeah. yeah. What does it tell you? What doesn't it tell you? How does the language data address the issues that come up when you are wrong? Um, being wrong is not, from my perspective, is not a thing to avoid. It's a thing to embrace and learn from. And I, I think it is different if you're trying to influence policy and policy measures, and public policy is involved in budget, like sort of incentive and impact, you know, a completely different frame of the reference. But if we're talking about a comeback in education, and there are male students from diverse backgrounds, and allowing that model really to get in. 
If I can make a comment and to refer it to Josh, because I think Josh, as a professional, will have a very interesting perspective on this. And I feel like we're going away from metrics that sum up this information in one key thing. And what people want to see is a portal layers. We look at the water risk filters, aquavit, and the work that our science is doing is like it's allowing you to do a superposition of this data set and looking at the intersections. So I think this conveys a lot of things on how you can place that information and there's yeah, some the definitive answer. Yeah, like allowing people to explore the uh Do you think also talking about how they did with the or how they collected their data? 